Good to go. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll make a way start. Well, welcome everyone to the um, meeting of the Regeneration Community Committee from Ananoma District Council on the 13th of September um, here in the Town Hall in Eskillen. And also members joining uh, the meeting online via WebEx. You're all very welcome this evening, members. Just before we commence the business this evening, oh, no, there's right some, some matters we want to deal with, members. Um, I feel it appropriate this evening that to bring a short tribute and express our condolences to um, His Majesty King Charles III um, on, and the royal family on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II last Thursday. The news came as a great shock to many and with much sadness. As just days previous, we saw uh, the Queen welcome the new Prime Minister at Balmoral. Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning British, British monarch and for many of us the only Queen we have ever known. She served with commitment and dedication and took a keen interest in Northern Ireland, having visited over 20 times, including visits to both of our main towns of Enniskillen and Oma. The Queen has indeed left a lasting legacy, which safe to say we will not see again see the like of in our lifetime. She was committed to peace and reconciliation and was an inspirational role model. The Queen said in her 2014 Christmas message, Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value all people of whatever faith or none. The Queen's strong Christian faith undoubtedly helped and guided her throughout her 70-year reign. While the Queen was much in the public Im image, we must realise she was a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and there's a family in mourning tonight. So we send our sincere condolences. We acknowledge that this is a period of transition and change. The Elizabethan era is over and a new reign begins. We pay tribute to... His Majesty King Charles III, and pray he knows God's guidance as he takes on his new roles and responsibilities. God save the King. Thank you, members. We'll just um, go to the floor now for a comment. Councillor Robinson, I'll, you had a proposal you brought to my attention. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to propose that we light up the castle, castle on Street Arts Centre. Uh, be a date or a colour counsellor, obviously? Uh, Sunday before the funeral. The Sunday before the funeral? Yeah. And Councillor Armstrong? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second that to give a period of reflection. And the, the colour pur you. purple, is that correct? And the colour purple, thank you. Purple. Is that all agreed, members? Thank you. Councillor Maguire? I go to Margaret Cahirley. A Cahirley Agus a Cardia, our son group of Corlary Hen Fian, Bawailum Argo Vron, a horse to clan Elishago. On behalf of the Sinn Fein Councillor Group, I first wish to pass on our condolences to the family of Elizabeth II. Recognising our distinct and differing traditions, we cannot but acknowledge her historic reign and indeed in recent years her significant contribution to encouraging reconciliation and support for the Good Friday Agreement. Her historic handshake with Ogluck Martin McGuinness and her simple gesture locally of walking across from St. McCartan's to St. Michael's will always be remembered. Both these deeds gave the opportunity to those who sincerely seek a lasting peace to engage with others that would not have seemed possible before. We also acknowledge the sorrow felt by our citizens of the Unionist and British tradition. We look forward to the continuation of the positive efforts she made to the advancement of peace and reconciliation between the different traditions on our island. Our yes, J. Garo Ahanam. Guramagata Kehrli, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, obviously the death of Queen Elizabeth II was uh, met with much sadness uh, by the vast majority of the population of Northern Ireland. She was an individual who for 70 years uh, as sovereign was committed to the role that was placed on her from such a young age. A role that she carried out selflessly for all the people in the UK, the Commonwealth and indeed around the world. I know that not everyone recognised her as the head of state, but nevertheless, she was prepared to reach the hand of friendship across the political divide to help achieve peace here in Northern Ireland. We must also remember that the Queen was a mother 
a grandmother and a great-grandmother. And for this, we send deepest sympathy from the Ulster Unionist Party councillors and from Anna and Oma District Council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. At the outset, on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party Group, I then express my thanks to the Council Chair for opening the books of condolence in the Green Joma and the Town Hall in Eskillen and online to allow the residents of this district the opportunity to express their sympathy to the Royal Family at this time. On Thursday evening, the 8th of September 2022, we, like so many others in our district and across the world, were deeply shocked and very sorry to learn of the passing of our highly respected long-serving monarch, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, at Balmoral Castle in Scotland at the age of 96 years. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was a great servant, having given quite literally a lifetime of service to the United Kingdom, to the wider Commonwealth over a period of more than 70 years. But most of all, she was a beloved wife to the late His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, a beloved mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and a dearly loved member of the wider royal family. On a personal note, my wife Elaine and I have good memories of having had the honour and pleasure of being in the presence of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at meeting his Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. This was on the occasion of the official opening of the South West Acute Hospital in Enniskillen by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in June 2012. I was in attendance on that special occasion in my role as Chairman of the Legacy Oma District Council. We will never forget that important event. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was also my boss for a long number of years when I was a serving soldier in Northern Ireland, working to bring peace and stability to her country, a role she was certainly very supportive of. And you can see the fruits of her labours uh, to this day. Ma'am, we say thank you for your service and devotion as our sovereign to the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. We as a country mourn your passing. On behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party Council Group, I expect or I ex express my deepest sympathy and our deepest sympathy to His Majesty King Charles III, Queen Consort, and the Royal Family at this very sad and difficult time. God save the King. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, uh, members. Uh, thank you, Chair, for affording members the opportunity uh, to pay tribute uh, to uh, the late monarch, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, thank you as well to Councillor Michael Duff, Council Chair, for opening the Book of Condolence uh, in uh, the Grange in Oma, the Town Hall in Enniskilla and online. Chair, this evening is not a time for a debate on the value of the monarchy, nor is it a time for uh, debating the constitutional question. But it is certainly the time to pay tribute uh, to someone whom I regard as being an exceptional lady and certainly someone who has been a role model for me, particularly in my public life. Chair, I was aware of Her Majesty's uh, failing health, but I was really deeply shocked and saddened to hear of her death on the evening of the 8th of September. And I think it is true to say that her passing evoked great shock, grief and regret, not only in the United Kingdom, but also uh, throughout the world. Um, Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth was widely regarded uh, as an exceptional person, 
someone who fulfilled her role as a monarch with great dignity, with great a great sense of duty, uh, with a great deal of commitment, energy and a sense of fulfilling her responsibilities uh, to the people uh, of um, the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. And uh, to give 70 years of service was a remarkable record. And the fact that uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth was receiving the new British Prime Minister 48 hours before her death, I think attests to her commitment that she would say, serve uh, her people uh, for the duration of, of her life. Chair, you have referred to her a strong Christian faith, something that I have admired. And we saw uh, in our own island uh, her remarkable um, words and uh, actions during her visit to the Republic of Ireland in 2011 and indeed in 2012 uh, when she visited Enniskillen. She was a woman who was deeply committed to peace, reconciliation, forgiveness and building new relationships. And Chair, it is my deepest hope that the work that Her Majesty uh, uh, was so committed to in promoting reconciliation, particularly in Ireland, that that work would go forward as a lasting tribute to her extraordinary life. So in conclusion, Chair, I want to express my personal deep condolences to His Majesty uh, King Charles uh, III, to the Queen Consort, to other members of the Royal Family, and indeed to those throughout uh, the United Kingdom and indeed the world who uh, uh, mourn her passing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Mary Garda. Thank you and good evening, Chair. Unfortunately, on behalf of the SDLP, we want to offer our sincere condolences to everyone who has mourned and is grieving the loss of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, apologies, my husband. Um, Queen Elizabeth um, has been a devoted servant over her many years. And I think behind all that, we came to forget that she was, you know, a grandmother and a much loved mother and, and all her different day to day roles that she played within her family unit that would have been um, not for us to see on a day to day basis. Um, we prayed for Queen Elizabeth at Mass in the village at our vigil mass at 8 p.m. on Saturday night and 11 a.m. on Sunday. And I think the canon summed it up quite well. He referred to Queen Elizabeth as being a lovely lady who loved Ireland and was indeed a peacemaker. So I don't think I can sum it up any better than that on behalf of ourselves. And I want to say God bless to herself and to her family and we hope they get through this difficult time. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Garty and members for your comments. Um, members, I'm aware this evening also that we do have Councillor Rene in our midst. Councillor Rene, um, on behalf of myself and the, the council, I'd like to pass on our deepest sympathy to you on your loss. We do trust that you and your family will know God's help in the days ahead in a very sad and difficult time. And I know there is members who would wish to comment um, on Alan's behalf as well. Members, at this stage, before we take any more comment, could I ask that we would stand for a moment's silence, please? Thank you, members.
Can I come in as a second, Alan? Can I let the speakers in? Is that okay? Councillor McAlduff is indicating. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair, very much. Um, on behalf of the Sinn Féin group and on my own behalf, uh, can I extend our deepest sympathy, Covelon, to Councillor Alan Rennie, the Vice Chair of the Council, until Philip Rennie's uh, entire family circle, uh, Philip being Alan's grandson, of course. And I would specifically mention his partner, Gemma, and baby Archie. It was said at the funeral service on Sunday that it was his proudest moment, young Philip's proudest moment, when baby Archie was born. Until Philip's parents, Mark and Nicola, Mark being, of course, the son of Alan, and uh, the grandparents, the, the Rennie and McKeown families. Um, I was pleased, if that's the right word, to be able to attend on Sunday along with our group leader, uh, Councillor Tommy Maguire. And uh, I have to say the service made a big impression on both of us and on myself. There was a huge crowd there, a lot of young people, and it showed the, the high esteem in which young Philip and the family are held within the community. So Coverown own Cree, and in Irish that means uh, sympathy from the heart. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much again, Chair. On behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party, can I take this opportunity to extend our heartfelt sympathy to the Rainey family, and in particular, Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, uh, whose grandson, Philip Rainey, died so tragically at the age of 21, and has left his partner and a young baby son we think of them particularly at this time, and we also think of Councillor Alan Rainey and his family, and to Philip's mum and dad as well, and his other siblings. Uh, there are, words cannot say how we feel about this matter. Uh, it's just such a tragic incident, and I want to extend my deepest sympathy at this time to Councillor Alan Rennie, MBE, and the full family circle. On behalf of myself, my family, and the Democratic Unionist Party grouping on for Man and Council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for affording us the opportunity of expressing our condolences to our Council colleague, uh, Councillor Alan Rennie. Um, Chair, I, I personally would want to extend my deepest sympathy uh, to uh, uh, the Rainey family on the tragic death uh, of Philip, uh, who died very tragically at the young age of 21 uh, and just at a time in his life uh, where he was enjoying uh, the birth of his new son. And uh, words cannot express uh, the magnitude of this loss, of this tragic loss of the life of a beautiful young man uh, and uh, a new father. Um, I want to say to uh, the Rainey family that um, they're all remembered in our thoughts uh, and in our prayers at this very, very difficult time. I had the opportunity of attending the wake and... Um, Philip's father, uh, Mark, uh, spoke very movingly uh, about his son uh, and about the joy that he found in the birth of young Archie. So to Gemma, to Archie, uh, to Mark, to Nicola and to Councillor Allen, my, my deepest sympathy and my thoughts and prayers will go forward with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Paul Blake. Thanks, Chair. Could I, on behalf of the SDLP group, express the deepest condolences to Councillor Alan Rainey, Council colleague, and especially after all that's happened to poor Philip, when we when we think and as a family celebrating the birth of a baby into the world and then for another young life to be so tragically cut short is, is in very tragic circumstances. So deepest sympathy to, to Alan. Thanks, Paul. And Councillor Warrington. 
just to our council colleague, uh, Councillor Rainey, we have spoken to him quite a bit and have been with him, uh, several of us, uh, in the last few days. And obviously, just to reiterate our, our sympathy to Alan and to the family on the death of um, young Philip, it was a very uh, sad and emotional time. And certainly, uh, I'd like to think we as a party have been able to to help Alan and give him strength during that time. So thank you. Thank you, members and councillor Rainey. <coughs> well, Chairman, thank you. And thank you for the minute's silence from this council. It really speaks volumes. I am really deeply, deeply touched by that, by all of it. For all the, the, the messages that I have received from fellow councillors from all shades and for those who attended the home and those who attended the service on Sunday. <clears throat> Most inclement weather, it certainly didn't put them off. For the crowds of people that, uh, that stood along the route during the, the cortege in the the, the the weather that uh, persisted at that particular time spoke really volume. Uh, as it has been said, Philip was a, a quiet and uh, pleasant guy. Uh, he was my grandson. I suppose you expect me to say that, but that was just his life. That was his nature. And... Uh, he was diligent in his work. He was diligent in his sport, and he was diligent in his home life. And, and uh, very recently, then he had uh, uh, he had got himself a partner, and they were blessed with having a baby boy. And it was a tragic accident when he was making his way to the hospital to bring them both home. It has been, it, it has been uh, recorded that he was overtaking a car on the, uh, just uh, as he started off on the motorway section above Dungannon. And there was one of those freak heavy, heavy showers and uh, when he pulled in to take up his own position again, uh, obviously the car aquaplaned on, 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 the, on the water and skidded off and down over the bank and hit the tree. The tree came down on the roof of the car and killed him instantly to the back of the head. Nothing more I can say. Thank you all so very much for your thoughts and prayers. It means the world to the Rainey family at this very sad time. Also, Chair, I want to say thank you to our Council Chair for affording me the, oppor the opportunity of accompanying our Chief Executive to St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast today to the service of reflection and thanksgiving for Her Majesty the Queen and uh, have the opportunity of being there when her King and, uh, and, uh, and Queen Consort were welcomed there as well. It was a very touching and a very emotional uh, uh, opportunity. I suppose, uh, uh, I don't know whether you could say in the circumstances it was a pleasure to be there, but certainly uh, I was delighted to have that opportunity and I'm indebted to our council chairman for affording me that opportunity. I am... Uh, 
I'm wearing the my jewel, uh, Her Majesty's fingerprints are on it. I had that opportunity of going along. Uh, she was well briefed on her subject on that particular day. It was short time after the OMA bomb. And she certainly put me at ease uh, uh, when she talked so freely about it and uh, wasn't afraid to ask me uh, questions as well and engage me in the conversation. I've had the opportunity of going visiting to visit the, the, the palace in London and uh, to the garden party in London and to Hillsborough Castle as well. And so I am, I am, uh, well, I, I uh, bring condolences to the royal family. Uh, I have had my fair share of, of uh, perhaps more uh, pleasurable times with them. And uh, I do wish the new king well in his reign and his God save the king. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rennie, for your words. Uh, Councillor McAleer is indicating. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate you letting me in. I'd, I was hoping to get in just before uh, Councillor Rennie spoke, just to offer my condolences as well on the, the tragic loss of his grandson. And I think when you hear the 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 incident that happened and the everything surrounding it, you know, the um it's not that way long since I became a new father myself as well. So I can uh completely appreciate and and my heart goes out to the family at the pain that they're suffering at the minute. And uh just uh, yes, Jake or Anam, just send my condolences to to Councillor Rainey and to his wider family on their tragic bereavement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd like to also offer my condolences to Councillor Rainey. Um, very, very sad, very sad tragedy. Um, my thoughts are with him and his father. Thank you. Thank you. Members, can I just say thank you for, for that time at the beginning of the meeting? And uh, be assured, Alan, of our thoughts and prayers at this time. We will move on, members, with the business. If you, sorry, Councillor Rainey. I would like to be excused. I don't intend to stay for the duration of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, thank you for that. Uh, first item, members, on our agenda this evening is any apologies. So, uh, Councillor McGuire, any apologies? I go wrong to Carly. Uh, just one apology, uh, Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Warrington. Uh, Councillor Alex Baird. Thank you. Councillor Mary Gardy. Thank you, Chair. No apologies this evening. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. No apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Eamon Keenan. Oh, sorry, maybe it's up on there. Is there any other apologies? Sorry, Thank members, you. at this point. Okay. Item number two is to sign the minutes and the confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the 6th of July. Those have been signed, members. Any declarations of interest at item number three? Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Um, agenda item 6.4, funded programmes update as a member of Peace 4 and Peace Plus Chair, and also agenda item 8.1, report on proposal of application notice as a member of the planning committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you again, Chair. Uh, de declaration of interest in 6.4 as a member of Peace Plus and 8.1, it's a pan, so obviously the planning committee, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. 6.4, Peace, Peace 4 and Peace Plus and uh, 8.1 planning. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Likewise, um, item number 6.4 is a member of Peace uh, 4 and Peace Plus. 
Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Six point four, please. Four and piece plus and eight point one. A member of the planning committee. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, item six point six, the Labour Market Partnership. Just that references um Southwest College as a stakeholder. So just as an employee of Southwest College, I think it's safer I declare an interest on that one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Irvine. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, 6.5, um, member of MSW, and 8.1 as a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, agenda item 7.2 is an employee of Waterways Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, Chair, a uh, declaration of interest in 6.1, Agriculture Liaison Group. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coyle, John Coyle. Uh, thank you, Chair. 6.4 um, as a member of the Peace Plus and 8.1 as a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glenn Campbell. Yes, Chairman, sorry for the delay there. Um, uh, 8.1 as a member of the Planning Committee and uh, also the item relating to South West College. I just didn't get the uh, I just forget the number there, but it's the same declaration as Councillor McAleer. Thank okay. you, Chair. And Councillor Garda. Thanks, Chair. Just 6.5 is a member of Mid South West. Thank you. Okay. And Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Let me in again, Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, 6.5, the Mid South West Government Steel Group. Okay. Thank you. And Councillor O'Reilly. 6.4, Chair. Uh, Peace Plus. Okay. Thank you. Members, Councillor Michael Duff. 6.5 and 8.1. Thank you, Chair. Okay, just check your hands, members. If we pick up any more, we'll take them as we go. Um, matters arising, item number four, the minutes from the 6th of July, 2022, page one, page two, page three, page four, and page five. Kim has an item on page five, members. Thank you, Chair. So this relates to the uh, item 5.3 and our study in relation to fracking um, and the correspondence sent to the Minister for the Economy. And there's a response at item 9.5. The Minister notes that this is an important issue for residents in the, and representatives in the area and thanks us for enclosing the report. Is this correspondence for noting, Kim? Yeah, OK. Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, Chair, I had a, an issue on page two I wanted to raise, but <clears throat> in relation to the fracking uh, report, uh, I think it is um, timely now that we have this uh, evidence uh, to hand, uh, which makes such a strong case against this uh, toxic industry. And uh, I'd like to propose that um, a copy of that uh, be sent to the incoming minister with responsibility for uh, energy policy in London, because uh, from the remarks that have been made uh, by the newly uh, appointed uh, the, uh, Prime Minister of the, the Conservative Party, uh, it appears that they are intent not just on rolling back uh, the democratically expressed wishes in regional governments uh, in Scotland on this issue, but also right across the United Kingdom. So. I think it's very important that we as a council uh, send a very strong uh, response uh, very quickly to the incoming uh, minister uh, in the Conservative government uh, that we will not accept uh, fracking being imposed above the heads of our admittedly non-existing Stormont executive, uh, but at least this council is uh, on the front foot and will be on the front foot on this issue. So that's a proposal I'd like to make. Uh, there was one question I had on page two, if possible, which was around social supermarkets. Um, <laughs> uh, in regard to social supermarkets, I, I note that we have made a number of decisions. Uh, I, it, it has uh, come to my attention that there are uh, maybe in existence some community support structures which feel that the model uh, that we're taking, which I did express an opinion on previously, in relation to social supermarkets, that we are departing from what is normal across other parts of Northern Ireland. Um, there are, I've, I've certainly had it expressed to me that um, 
you know, why are we taking a different road? And that the social supermarket is, uh, as, as has been maybe enacted in other councils, for example, Derry City and Straban, uh, has uh, a, plays a vital role in terms of providing access to low cost foodstuffs, uh, which is uh, different than the model that we've adopted, which is much more around food banks. So um, I'm wondering why it is that we have uh, have, have any um, submissions or uh, engagements with the council from the community sector being made to request a similar approach as has been taken in other councils. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members will deal with just the, the first piece of correspondence that we had there. Councillor Feely. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll second the donor proposal there about, okay, the, yeah. about the fracking, and I myself, like, would be very much against fracking. I know this letter we got back is very short and there's not much in it, but I just want to be let people know about our opposition to fracking. When you hear about this thrust and maybe lift the monotomy on fracking in, over in England, they can definitely, we would just want to keep on the front foot of it and just make sure there's no fracking ever comes out. Because with all the talk of oil and gas now, the scarcity of it has come back on the agenda now. So we just want to keep opposed to it. Thank you and happy to stay. Councillor O'Reilly. It's on the uh, page two on this. Okay, members, just a proposal. Are we, are we agreed on the proposal by Councillor O'Coffey and seconded by Councillor Philly that we write to uh, the Minister? All agreed? And can I have a proposal to note, please, the, the report, Councillor Robinson and a seconder by Councillor Armstrong. We all agreed on, on that, or to, to note the correspondence, sorry, members. And back to Councillor O'Coffey's uh, on, on page two in the social supermarket. Was there... Uh, to Councillor O'Reilly, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I suppose something uh, on a similar vein to, to what Donald was talking about there, uh, we are probably facing in, if not certainly facing into a very uh, difficult winter ahead and, and even beyond. And um, while we note the uh, increased usage of food banks and so forth, I think there will be uh, an increased need to do more than just the uh, standard food bank. Now, I understand from my colleague, Councillor uh, Michael Duff, the chair that he was at, um, one in Kesh that was a good example uh, with a coffee shop uh, fronting it uh, that made it uh, more accessible than just a food bank in itself operating one day a week or whatever. And I think maybe going forward there is, I would like to uh, propose two things, that we look at how we could uh, try to replicate something uh, of a similar nature uh, right across the district uh, with other organisations uh, to sort of see if there is an opportunity to provide uh, some low-cost uh, hot food or at least uh, a point where you can get in out of the cold, maybe for people that are going to be struggling. Uh, and the other uh, Point that I wanted to uh, propose, Chair, is that we investigate with the supermarkets. I certainly heard, and maybe this is already happening, I heard if it's maybe Scotland or somewhere where there is actual legislation now that the supermarkets must give away their food that is in sell-by date or in excess and so forth like that. And I'm just looking to see if there is uh, something similar here and as a local area, if we could make uh, contact, even if there wasn't legislation chair, to see if we can uh, work something out like that. I think as a, as we heard before here, you are not going to have the same level of intervention by central government this time around as you had with the COVID, but it'll be much more left up to ourselves. And the ratepayer can't foot the full build on that, but we certainly could be working in partnership to get some premises, to get systems in place that could help a lot of our citizens that are going to find a, a struggle over the months ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll be keen to move this on, members. So, Councillor O'Coffey, could you are you looking in there again on that? I'm happy to second that proposal. And happy it? that that okay. Yeah. Has everyone agreed on that, members? Thank you. Okay. Page that was page five or page two members. So we're we're up on page six now. Page seven, page eight, and page nine. There's an item as well. Kim, thank you. 
Page nine under Broadband Working Group, Chair, at the bottom of the page, we have responses from Sky and from Openreach um, at 4.1.1 and 4.1.2. Sky has commented that they understand the need for accurate data, but it's not a broadband infrastructure provider um, and feels it's not best placed to provide further clarification on the matter. Openreach has responded, uh, refers to the open market review exercise, um, which allows it to provide information to a procuring authority and um, that they work through the Ofcom uh, office in terms of the reporting of broadband current speeds and any proposal to change the calculation of speed estimates is agreed with DCMS as it would have uh, UK-wide implications. Uh, in terms of project stratum, there's also a letter at 9.7 from the Department for the Economy from the Minister um, in relation to the procurement of Project Stratum, which it says is aligned to the National Broadband Scheme. Uh, it again refers to the open market review and to the two phases, one being consultation with broadband infrastructure providers and the second being a public consultation, uh, which uh, allowed citizens also to identify if their postcode was included. Uh, it confirms that Premises were only excluded from the target intervention area if the telecommunications industry confirmed they were receiving 30 megabytes broadband services or were anticipated to do so. The correspondence also refers to the pricing arrangements and um, also to the rural proofing implications and in terms of the reference to a discount if members, if customers signed up to a commercial company. Uh, the minister notes that this is part of that. It, this is a commercial matter and is common practice. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, that's two pieces of correspondence before us. There, Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it was maybe myself that uh, asked for um, or brought this up in relation to uh, why that. Uh, premises had been excluded from Project Stratum. And what I had been hearing was that they had been excluded because uh, Project Stratum, or the department, had contacted other providers, asked for a list of their, their uh, customers, and then duly excluded them from Project Stratum. Uh, never inquired from the providers whether they could uh, provide the 30 megabytes, uh, of, uh, uh, whether they could provide that or not. I was told by some of the providers that I was talking to that they never claimed they could provide the 30. They were never asked could they provide the 30, uh, but all their customers were excluded pro from Project Stratum. So I don't see any, any answer to this. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just couldn't quite hear Kim there, uh, what you're saying about the response from the department, but um, I don't see any, anything in any of them replies that actually deals with that question. Uh, uh, why so many houses, homes and families across our district was excluded because they had signed up to some one or another wireless provider or whatever satellite provider or whatever, who never guaranteed the authority, uh, but were excluded. And I would uh, still uh, insist that they do tell us whether they excluded people without finding out the evidence, because if that's what they did, that's, that's a serious flaw in what the depart department did. And remember, this is public money that's been spent. And when they talk about the commercial decisions, it's our money that's been spent on these commercial decisions that they're, they're, they're talking about. So I would propose we definitely write back to the department very firmly to find out the answer to them questions. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, these letters, as has just been remarked, um, uh, quite disgraceful, really. Uh, the one from Sky effectively dodges very blatantly the question which we've asked, which is whether they had supplied the information uh, on uh, who was covered and who would be covered. The response from BT Openreach uh, is, uh, is even more um, dishonest in the sense that it's um, 
it 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 almost makes the argument that they have to uh, they have to provide information to the uh, the department's discrete super fast reconsultation open open market review. That's some mouthful, um, and that they we will provide information uh, to support a procuring authorities' in, in request for inputs, which again tells you absolutely nothing. They will do this if there is a request for input. So. From what you, if you read between the lines there, it would appear that this information is not being supplied to uh, the department. Then the department's correspondence itself appears to contradict that, of course. Um, <clears throat> but most importantly is the point that's made on the second page, which is that uh, fibrous networks, uh, which is equivalent to BT Open World, I guess, um, will be uh, potentially hiring out uh, use of its network to other internet service providers uh, in a market model. And what we have managed, or what Stormont has managed to do in its infinite uh, intelligence is uh, to establish two monopolies effectively uh, through public funding. Massive public resources have gone into funding this. We've created two infra infrastructural monopolies uh, who would operate the networks and then operate on top of that uh, a market, all of which is completely unnecessary. Uh, it should be a simple system provided, uh, like, uh, you know, broadband could be provided very, everyone could have access to it. I think it was Jeremy Corbyn said that uh, we should have nationalized broadband. And I think uh, every the day that goes by, it becomes more obvious that that's an obvious solution. But uh, with a huge expenditure of public funds to create a duplication of provision uh, in areas where uh, there is potentially a return on for for, for profit, uh, and then leaving still without access uh, entire swathes of rural areas which actually need this provision. So, in every possible dimension, I think that this uh, the 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 approach taken by consecutive Stormont ministers has completely failed uh, our communities, uh, the economy. And, and has resulted in colossal waste of precious public resources. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. And uh, while I agree that there is uh, uh, some work done to improve the broadband, there is uh, an awful lot more that needs to be done. And while uh, we can uh, argue the merits or not of how the approach has been undertaken, the reality is that uh, we are elected here to try and uh, argue and fight for the provision within our council area. And to that end, Chair, I appreciate we have a, a broadband meeting on the 27th of this month, but I would like to ask uh, Kim if she had any update as to where we are as a group, as a council, to be able to understand how many people in our own area uh, have been disenfranchised and what uh, numbers are being put back onto uh, the uh, additional system of uh, broadband provision that uh, is to be rolled out. Okay, thank you. Kim, do you want on this point? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't have the numbers quite to hand, but I, I do have them available and can share them afterwards and I can bring that report to the Broadband Working Group. Um, we have also done some further research based on the most recent list of postcodes and have submitted uh, some further requests to the, the Department in respect of their, their latest rollout. So I'll bring a full uh, report on that to the Broadband Working Group this month. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair, and I'm glad you're, you're coming to us now as well. Um, hopefully you can see our hands up, just add my hand up to speak on the the point raised by Councillor O'Coffey in relation to the, the Tory party and the, their donors in the fracking industry, but we're, I appreciate we're on that now. But just if, if yourself as Chair or whoever's advising, you could keep an eye on the hands going up online, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'm happy enough to to second the proposal from Councillor Green that we go back to the department. I think on top of that, we need to go back to BT and we need to go back to Sky because simply put, as previous speakers have said, they haven't answered the question that this council has put to them. 
And I think Councillor O'Coffey quite rightly and quite eloquently hits the nail on the head that this pursuit of neoliberalism and the pursuit of shimmying off everything to the open market at the expense of the public and expense of the public purse is something that is now coming home to roost. And we, we see that wherever we turn, and this is just another example of it. And I think the more utility workers and the more people we see out on strike and it's growing week by week is just uh, as a direct result of what's been done here. As, as quite rightly said, as Councillor Green quite rightly put, the money has been spent and it's not been directed where it was supposed to be directed. This was supposed to be something which benefited rural areas and rural broadband. But we're seeing quite clearly that that's not what is done. But again, it just seems to be symptomatic and par for the course that this is what happens. And, you know, I, I, Councillor O'Reilly is quite right that we need to see how we can progress and how we can improve things as they stand. But we need to tackle this co this root problem that seems to be at the cause of everything that's happening and everything that goes wrong and filters down to the people and to the people we represent. And that's what we're elected to do, is to challenge these these quite inadequate decisions that squander millions of pounds of public money and stand only to benefit the private sector. And the proposal uh, by Councillor or by by Jeremy Corbyn when he was Labour leader to, to nationalise broadband provision, how beneficial would that have been to families right across this di district when we were in the midst and in the throes of a pandemic and a lockdown? And yet we're struggling and we're still struggling a couple of years into Project Stratum with people being left behind and still people not having uh, adequate broadband provision. I think we need to just take a bit look at the bigger picture here and just be aware of what's going on and what we need to do as elected reps to counter that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coyle. Councillor John Coyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's good to see members coming in because I have spoken about this for a number of years, 2017. Uh, when Stormont collapsed, uh, we were talking about, you know, the confidence and supply agreement, uh, about what Project Stratum was going to do. Uh, we lobbied hard in this council for to get the for our constituents the broadband that they deserved and the people that were in the greatest need. Uh, these letters that have sent back uh, very inadequate um, obviously it doesn't matter what company they are not going to give you the information because they don't want to lose uh, lose their customers all i want for my constituents is have the opportunity and uh, the choice of what provider they want to go to a lot of them are just in in one provider they are stuck with that provider because nobody else can pro provide them the broadband that they need. Uh, I at home here, uh, BT says, oh, I can get broadband down my phone line. And I tell them, no, I can't. And they still say, oh, you can, but I can't. And I spoke last week to uh, BT Openreach engineers that were out here. And I says, uh, are you going to, you know, connect my house to, uh, you know, fibre to the home? And they said, no, Fibrous is, get, uh, is getting all that. But Fibrous have said no, that our postcodes and a lot of neighbours around here uh, that aren't going to get and to be availing of, uh, you know, Project Stratum. I, all I want is for our rural constituents to be treated fairly, like if it's in Belfast or Lisburn or, you know, Derry, London, Derry, that they have choice. They can go to the best deal that they feel and what is adequate for their home usage or their business or whatever. But we don't get that. Again, our backs are coming to the wall and uh, I fully support that uh, we write back. Uh, but. I don't think it'll make a bit of difference uh, to the providers. We need to keep at the Department of Economy and uh, Fibrous to get everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you, John. Councillor Campbell. 
Yes, Chair, I just want to speak in support of um, Councillor Green's proposal. Uh, it may have been second. I don't know if it's been seconded to write back, uh, but certainly I would have concerns, you know, if it were the case indeed that, that the due diligence, diligence wasn't been carried out really in terms of broadband speed and service that people's getting, I would be concerned indeed if they accepted the word of uh, the broadband provider because we do know that what's promised and, and what's actually delivered can be two different things. And I do know of cases like we all do really of people with neighbours either side getting getting the fibres but others not accessing uh, fibre to the home. So I do have concern and I would support and, and second Councillor Green's proposal. Thank oh, you. Sir. Thank you, Glenn. And Councillor Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, I think don't let don't look coffee hit the nail on the head when he said that uh, uh, you know there was millions of pounds of public money put into this and uh, two private companies set up just on the you know their sole interest is profit. Um, they're going to provide the bare minimum or in some cases some areas nothing at all, and uh, it's a typical neoliberal neoliberal trick, pu pump public money into private companies to extract profit from everybody, and we're stuck with a poor service. Um, Councillor O'Reilly, his point is valid too, that um, you know we're here, we're trying to fight our corner for our constituents, but in reality, we're just we're, we're begging for the crumbs of the table because there is no accountability. They're not accountable to us. We can only beg and ask, and they, they will only do where they, they will only move in and go where they see there's a profit. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn, his plans are nationalised. It, it, it definitely. <laughs> that we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. But this is only the, the, the latest project of the, the government's neoliberal strategy to privatise and suck public money out of everything to extract profits. And uh, uh, we're going to see it again and again until eventually the people in denial or the people, maybe the working class people, will rise up. The likes of Mick Lynch there, he, he's, he's, uh, he's sort of making making moves and opening eyes, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, Councillor Anthony Feely. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I'll not, I'll not be long, because I know you want to keep the meeting pushed on. I was going to come into Second Seamus' proposal as well, a very good proposal, but gladly Emmett was spotted and he got in to do it. No, I, I, well, I would be a resident that was left out too, for I, I'm not getting it in my house either, and another few houses up the road. But we, I think myself and Councillor Coyle has a, has a meeting organised with um, Faye, but some of them's going to come out to, to see the situation, we're going to bring them around to the houses just to see that it, it doesn't make any sense at all the way the neighbours have been left out. And I think it's been it's done sometime in end of October. Kim got to sort it sorted out for a fair play as well. Just when I am talking, I just want to mention another thing that Faber's done. Maybe Kim may take note of it and, and keep it pushed on a bit. The bottle banks in Garrison, Kim, the way Faber's put the overhead cables and they're supposed to move them, but they haven't got them moved yet. And uh, we get it done sooner rather than later because they are. Uh, Causing a bit of a mess down in, in the park, and I just wanted to bring that in Thank when you. I was talking. Thanks, um, Chair and Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Most of the topics have been covered. I'm wondering if uh, Seamus would consider including in his letter to BT asking how much infrastructure they have provided in this area since Fibrous took on the contract to provide infrastructure because there is duplicity out there where they have been putting in infrastructure in areas where then Fibrous have come along six weeks later and done work as well. So I'm wondering if Seamus would consider including that if they'd inform us what new infrastructure they have placed to provide full broad, full fibre broadband in this area following the contract being commenced by Fibrous. Okay. Seamus, you happy enough for that? Uh, I think that's a, almost a new letter that uh, uh, I would suggest make that proposal. And I have no uh, uh, problem in second it uh, 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 if it's a, yep, a standalone letter. No problem. So we can do that as well. Thank you, John and Seamus. So, members, we had the proposal by Councillor Green and seconded by Councillor McAleer to write back to the department. And then we heard Councillor McLaughlin's proposal there. And just we need a proposal to note the two pieces of correspondence. Councillor Armstrong, thank you, and seconded by Councillor Warrington. All agreed. Thank you, members. Page 10 of the matters raising, page 11. Councillor O'Coffey. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just in relation to the question of the reusable Christmas tree, which I believe is meant to come back to the, um, to the a future meeting. Is there any progress on that since? Thank you, Chair. On. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it, it was discussed yesterday at the Event Strategy Working Group and a report will be brought back at the October RNC meeting. Okay, thank you, John. Page 11, page 12, page 13. There's an item on page 14, members. Page 14 at the top of the page, just to note that I have followed up with um, Derry City and Strabane just to confirm that um, the Water Quality Statistics Report of December 2020 is not referred to in the submission because it was um, the submission was made by the legal team prior to the receipt of that report. Thanks for that update, Kim. Page 14, page 15. Uh, John, page 15. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, there's correspondence there from item 9.2.2 on page 15. Uh, from It's a response from NAEA in relation to the area of scientific interest, the SSA site monitoring, uh, where they indicate that the uh, site visits for Ben Leck and the more ASSIs were just recently completed and a full analysis has yet to be, has yet to be taken place but they're likely to be in favourable condition. In relation to the own Kalu and own Rhea rivers, river ASSIs, that the monitoring of these sites is currently not timetabled and they do take place on a six-year rolling basis. And in relation to the Drumlee and Mullen Roads, uh, it was monitor, monitoring took place in 2021 and that report is nearing completion um, and it is um, likely that it is under favourable management. Thank you, John. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll note the correspondence first, but of uh, subsequent comment and, and proposal on it just then. Uh, the correspondence is uh, regarding the monitoring of the Owen Killy River and the Owen Ray River ASSIs. I can advise that monitoring of the features on these sites is not currently timetabled. NIA uh, aims to monitor all ASSIs on a six year rolling basis, and each year agrees to an annual program approximately six months prior to the field season. My question, and I, and I propose that we go back to NIA on this, is when was the last uh, monitoring session carried out in the Owen Killew and the Owen Ray River ASSAs and request that they forward the, that last report on to us? And uh, subsequently, in terms of page two of the, the response to us, they, they talk about the Drumlay and Mullen Woods ASSAs uh, and the they say that the woodland is generally in good condition, described as unfavourable recovering. And my question there is when, since when was unfavourable a good description? So I would request that we get the 2022 report forwarded to council and to councillors when it's complete. And I would have a query as well, and I would appreciate if they could clarify this. They state that they monitor ASSIs on a six year rolling basis. What does that really mean? Because According to the figures and the facts that they have presented to us, the Drumlay and Mullen Woods were monitored in 2006 and 2012, but then not monitored again until 2021, which is actually nine years later. And we're told that the report is nearing completion at this stage, a year after it, it has been carried out. So if the structural diversity of the woodland habitat and the age class variation fails to meet set criteria, how can it be said to be good in, in good condition as previously referenced, when it's been described as unfavourable recovering. So I would propose that we go back to NIEA asking those questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Coffe. Yeah, I'm happy to second the note and the proposal there from Councillor McAleer. Um, I too would uh, hold some questions over the descriptions used, but really these are areas of special scientific interest and the idea that they're only looked at every six years in the hope that nothing uh, horrendous has happened in the interim period uh, is frankly, uh, I think it's a reflection of uh, the current state of environmental protection in Northern Ireland. Uh, we don't have an independent EPA. We have an NIEA, which is a subject and part of uh, the Department of Agriculture. And I think that that tells you all you need to know about uh, the attitudes of Stormont towards the environment. Uh, and the reality is when every single waterway in the whole of Northern Ireland is in deteriorating uh, water quality, we have uh, a Northern Ireland Environment Agency, which only inspects areas of special scientific interest 
every six years to make sure uh, just how bad things have become. So I'm very happy to bounce this back, but I have no confidence at all in NIEA. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, that's proposed and seconded, and also that separate proposal by Councillor Coffey and Michael Lee. Are we all agreed? Councillor Dehan. Uh, yes, uh, agreed, Chair, and supported. Um, I think recently uh, we've had this discussion before regarding uh, the effectiveness of NIEA in protecting uh, our environment. And at no time, Chair, is the protection of our environment more important uh, when uh, the whole planet is in danger. Uh, and I agree with Councillor Coffey, who uh, states that we do need an independent environmental protection agency and we have made that call previously uh, and unfortunately that call has gone unanswered but we will keep lobbying for it chair it's really important uh, we need to be sure that uh, NIEA sharpens up their act and uh, if they can't do that then we need an independent agency so happy to support Councillor McAleer's proposal chair thank you thank you okay members page 16 Page 17 and page 18. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just um, two quick questions on page 17 there. Um, the first, and I'm presuming well, there there has been no response just in relation to, or no update in relation to 10.2 in the cross-border movement of livestock manure at this stage. And secondly, just, and I know this is, a point of accuracy, but it's one that I had previously raised at at the correct time or at the approved time, um, in relation to the one of the resolutions on ten point three that it's um representatives of the Unite Trade Union. It was Unite Hospitality, and and I had specified that I suppose at a previous meeting when when I was advised to do so. So I was just wondering if that could be noted for the record as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. As far as I'm aware, members, if there's a if there's a response, it'll be. We, we, we'd be, it would be before us, is that correct? Okay, so we can take it as not. Thank you. Members, that is the matter's horizon. We'll move on the agenda to item number five. As you can see, members, we've quite a list of reports before us, so we would ask for your cooperation and uh, keep your comments brief if you can, please. Um, item 5.1 is to consider the report of Director of Community and Wellbeing, Paper A. Thank, Thank you, John. Chair. Yes, there, there are a number of issues or a number of items on, on the report. Uh, the first one is to seek approval um, for uh, a number of applications which we have received for significant sporting uh, achievement. Uh, the Fermanagh Ladies Gaelic Football Team, who took part in the Isle Ireland Junior Football Championship final on the 30th of July. The Tyrone Senior Hurling Team, who won the Nicky Rackard Cup on the 21st of May. The Tyrone Under-20 Football Team, who won the All Ireland Under-20 Championship on the 14th of May and the Tyrone Masters, who uh, were playing in the All-Ireland Final on the 10th of September and, and won that final uh, last Saturday. Uh, the, under, the, under the protocol that we have, the maximum award to uh, for a significant sporting achievement is £1,000, and, and the proposal is for each of those for, for £1,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and just let members know that uh, there is a review of the Significant Sporting Achievement Award ongoing and we hope to bring a report uh, through to members uh, in the near future. Uh, the second item is attendance at the APSI Sporting, uh, Sports and Leisure Seminar uh, in uh, London. Uh, again, according to our, our travel and subsistence policy, uh, for any travel uh, outside of, of the island, it requires uh, committee approval uh, and we're suggesting that an officer uh, attends uh, the seminar which is on building a new future for local authority leisure and, and it looks at uh, the various aspects of leisure and building leisure uh, post-COVID uh, and also about how we can be more efficient in, in, in our leisure services. Uh, the third item on, on the report is access to leisure and cultural facilities for refugees and this is coming from a, a previous uh, proposal from, from members. Uh, in relation to um, provision of leisure services for refugees um, in, in our district. We have met with Arano uh, and uh, have explained all the concession rates which we recently brought through for members for approval here. Uh, and they are happy with that and, and are actually uh, presently working with, with members, with refugees and asylum seekers uh, in order to promote that among them for use of our leisure service services. 
the fourth item is in relation to provision for English classes at the Southwest College for Refugees. And again, this is a report or an item which was being brought forward from the July RNC meeting. Um, in, in August of, of this year, the Department for Economy issued a circular which sets out the arrangements for eligibility requirements for, for access uh, to English speakers in other languages for refugees and various other uh, people who, have, who are in a country who, are, or who don't speak English uh, as their first language. And under the scheme, uh, participants can have free access um, to uh, English speakers of other languages, of course, uh, and there is, they can also provide a pre-entry for, for those um, who, who have poor English. Um, Southwest College have confirmed that the classes uh, can take place at the college or at external venues, depending on the numbers. Typically, uh, an 18-week course, uh, two sessions each week by, of three hours. Uh, and it's free of charge for those who are uh, refugees or asylum seekers. Uh, we are actually promoting it and we will promote it as, as part of our Ukrainian uh, welcome event on, on the 15th of September. The fifth item is in relation to a healthy living centre and members will be aware that we, we discussed this previously about looking at setting up a, a healthy living centre in, in Enniskillen. Uh, discussions have taken place with key stakeholders um, in the Enniskillen area and indeed with the Western Health Trust and the Public Health Agency. Um, and and it is, there is certainly a recognition that the healthy living centre, the collaboration that exists with, with between them and the community and the various uh, public sector bodies in, in health and wellbeing is important um, in, in the provision of healthcare at a very local level. Um, we, we also had discussion with, with a number of organisations in the Enniskillen area who, who do at the moment work uh, in collaboration with those statutory organisations and whilst not healthy living centres, they do provide those vital services in the community uh, in the same way as if they were a healthy living centre. Um, we are currently working in, and we've reported, especially at community planning, um, of the pilot projects, which is in Erin East and in the OMA uh, DEA, uh, working along with the Western Health Trust, the Public Health Agency, DERA, Department for Communities, and setting up a pilot project uh, for better collaboration and integration of health and wellbeing services among the public sector, the, the, the community and voluntary sector, the private sector, and, and, and ourselves. Um, and I suppose the colleagues in, in the trust and the public health agency who fund the existing provision of, of healthy living centres uh, are keen to take the learnings out of those pilot projects before they would see and, and creating something in Enniskillen um, before just looking at the establishment of, of a healthy living centre. And like I say, a provision is currently there. Um, and, and certainly I know officers um, have have... Uh, will work closer together with those organisations in prom promoting that integration and that collaboration in the Enniskillen area. The sixth item on the report is just an update on the progress of the redevelopment of the Fermanagh Lakeland Forum. We had a special council meeting in relation to the outline business case and, and it's just a very short update. Um, uh, we have made a, an application to the Leveling Up Fund, uh, which was submitted by the, the 5th of August deadline. Uh, and an integrated consultants team have been appointed, uh, led by Space and Place, who, who undertook the, the outline business case for us. Uh, and, and they are currently working uh, in, in, in looking at design. And, and uh, I've also submitted a pre-application notice uh, to for public consultation. I suppose the reason why I've brought this item through on the report today is just that Members may see the the the, the pre-application notice going out for consultation. Uh, members will have uh, an opportunity uh, prior to that process um, uh, commencing to receive a briefing on on the design development um, in early October, uh, and a full workshop on the consultation will be held with members in in late November, and, and those dates are, are currently being sought to, to uh, establish uh, the most suitable dates for for the both of those sessions. Uh, the seventh um, item on the report is the quarterly uh, RNC committee actions update from, from May to July. And you'll see that 75% um, of, of those are complete and, and 25 are in progress. So, Chair, um, just in relation to the recommendations, um, it's recommended that the Council approves the funding of £1,000 each to Fermanagh Ladies uh, Gaelic football team, Tyrone senior hurling team, the Tyrone under-20 football team and the Tyrone Masters. 
um, that it grants permission for an officer to attend the APSI Sport and Leisure Seminar at a total estimated cost of, of £500. Notes to update on access to leisure and cultural facilities for refugees. Notes to update on the provision for English classes at South West College for refugees. Notes to update on the possible establishment of the Healthy Living Centre in Enniskillen. Notes to update on the redevelopment of Manor Lakeland Forum. And notes to quarterly regeneration and community committee actions update. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. That's a big report. Seven recommendations, members. Uh, Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for the report, John. Uh, just one observation there on it. I don't know about anyone else, but the, the sound from the top table is very uh, bad. I think there's a provision to turn it up, maybe, with the, the Chair. Uh, I don't ever remember in a previous life uh, at some uh, games and that that uh, the director had such a soft voice, but uh, he has he has tonight. But uh, so uh, so uh, j just to to propose the recommendations, uh, and I'm delighted uh, to see the GEA finally getting its fair share of council funding. Um, it's a long way to catch up on some of the other sports, but I'm glad we're getting there. Thank you, Councillor, for that proposal. Councillor O'Kopic. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think this is a very interesting report. Um, the first point I really wanted to uh, welcome, it appears the progress that has resulted, and uh, I did uh, recall raising the issue of the current absence of a healthy living centre in Enniskillen, which is, as we will all know, uh, Enniskillen contains uh, the most deprived uh, electoral ward or uh, super output area in the Fermanagh Council uh, County side of things. Um, and I think it is quite important given the linkages that we know exist between social deprivation and poor health that we have uh, every uh, possible um, lever in action to try and uh, mitigate and address the issues that arise around poor health and uh, public health that uh, associated with uh, deprivation as well in particular. So um, I'm glad to see that this has been a productive engagement. I, I take it from the, the report that has been given that uh, there may be some developments uh, in this direction in the future. And I, I, I particularly want to welcome the fact that uh, local uh, practitioners who are involved in similar type projects have been engaged directly. And I think that they have a lot to offer uh, a, a potential uh, filling of this gap. Um, officially as maybe as they already are unofficially. Um, <clears throat> two questions. The first, uh, neither one of which relates to that issue. Uh, the first is on page three around the ABSI Sports and Leisure Seminar. I note uh, that this is going to explore the state of the leisure provision market. Now, when I see the word market, um, I, I usually have some concerns because to me, leisure should be a service. It's provided to our uh, uh, people to encourage activity, uh, healthy living, and so on. Uh, and we all know what the market and leisure has meant in other council areas in Northern Ireland, some of them uh, having to uh, withdraw from private sector outsourcing, which has not only eroded uh, the, the terms and conditions of the workforce, uh, creating two-tier workforces, but also led to massive increases and hikes in access and uh, also cutting off access to uh, lower income areas. So I would be uh, keen to determine that uh, no uh, notion of uh, outsourcing is going to be explored at that ABSI uh, conference. The second uh, issue, uh, just a question around um, the levelling up fund uh, on page uh, 2, 1.7, uh, where there's a report back on the redevelopment of the Lakeland Forum under the levelling up form. Fund. The only thing I really wanted to raise was that when we met the Minister uh, uh, for Infrastructure, he appeared to intimate that his desire was that our council would progress uh, an application to the levelling up fund in relation to the Southern Bypass, um, which is contrary to what we have done. But at the same time, he also appeared to intimate that, uh, that the, an application had been submitted nonetheless, uh, perhaps from the department. So. Is there any information that, uh, on what has happened in regard to that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well, we'll go to Councillor McAleer and then we'll come back. Is that OK? Yeah. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to initially acknowledge the uh, point 1.2 point 
uh, and they send my congratulations to the teams listed and obviously commiserations to the Fermanagh ladies who were unsuccessful after a replay. But I suppose on an optimistic note, since I think it was Louth lost to Finland in 2018, the beaten finalist has returned to claim the title the following year. So um, send me good wishes for 2023. Um, I'd especially like to congratulate the Throne Masters, the over 40s team, on the significant sporting achievement of uh, winning back-to-back -back All Ireland titles with a, a hard-fought one-point extra time victory over Dublin uh, and County Cavan at the weekend. There, and um, send congratulations to my my clublet clubmate Plunkett Tui to a neighbour of my own Connor Gormley and a former classmate and Mickey Anderson and obviously to everyone else involved. Um, but just on a on a point of uh, declaring an interest chair, I note that on sec item 1.5 on page 2 of the report, uh, it references again uh, courses provided by Southwest College. So as an employee, I will declare an interest and not participate further in this one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Alison. Did, uh, no, want... thank you, Chair. It was just specifically to respond to Councillor O'Coffey's comments regarding the ministers uh, about around the levelling up. So, no, the Council had resolved that we would make an application to the Leveling Up Fund for the Lakeland Forum, which we did. Subsequent to that decision, DFI asked us would we support their application to the Leveling Up Fund for the Enniskillen Southern Relief Bypass, and I indicated we couldn't do so because we were already competing ourselves within the fund. I was unclear from the Minister's comments. I don't think they submitted the application in the end, but certainly it wasn't with our support and they acknowledged that and recognised it is included within the growth deal. Thank you, Chief Executive. Um, Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly, please. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just coming in a similar vein to Councillor McAleer to congratulate the teams listed at 2.1, particularly the Throne Masters who won back-to-back -back All-Irelands at the weekend. Two of the players were from uh, my local club here and from Quinn. I have put in a request to the chair for a chairman's reception for them, but perhaps given the success of the other teams, it may be worth considering a similar or combining the event for the other successful teams. But congratulations to everyone involved. Thank you. And if yeah. have all the recommendations been seconded, Chair? I uh, know. I'll take a seconder. Yep. Thank second. you, Councillor Donald. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Councillor McElduff. Councillor McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to acknowledge Councillor Anne Marie Dunley there and uh, the work that she did, you know, to help secure that recognition for the Throne Masters over 40s at the weekend there. Um, that significant sport and achievement award is a particular uh, award that maybe not everyone was aware of, but fair play to Anne Marie for being sharp on that one. And then also, we are getting to grips, Chair, uh, with uh, various upcoming receptions. You know, the summer being a wee bit irregular, um, working closely with the Chief Executive and with Leanne, Democratic Services, etc., to um, to move on these receptions, some of which are outstanding. And just to acknowledge as well um, that in relation to one item or one other item on that report, to thank John Boyle, our director, for that engagement with Irano regarding uh, access to leisure and cultural facilities. That was a satisfactory outcome, you know. Perhaps Irano went in with maybe higher expectations at the beginning, but uh, the result was very good and everybody's very satisfied with the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. And my point actually just dovetails with what Councillor McAuley or Councillor McAuley said. It's concerning the, the leisure and cultural facilities for refugees. Really, um, bearing in mind um, the, the strong tradition of boxing and wrestling in Ukraine, um, could, I, could I propose that we look at the provision of boxing and wrestling where there is an interest proved um, within the district? Thank you. Yeah, we'll thank take you, that Chair. proposal. Is there a seconder for that proposal, Councillor McLaughlin? Thank you. Okay, members. Um, we all agreed on on that report. Councillor O'Coffey, you've already had three minutes now, so just a sentence. Yeah, it's just a uh, coming back in on the response from the chief executive, which I thought was very informative. Um, I, I, I one, I was just wondering where that was considered by us as a council that decision not to uh, support the uh, the. The Department for uh, Infrastructure um, 
proposal and two, to make a proposal as well, because there seems to be a lack of clarity from the, uh, the department. Uh, can we clarify through a letter to the minister whether they have indeed made an application to the levelling up fund uh, for the Southern Bypass? And furthermore, can we have clarification that uh, if that did not proceed, that this has not resulted or will not result in any further delay to the Southern Bypass for Enniskillen, which is absolutely vital to our economy? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Blake, you're right on now. Yeah, I'd be happy to second that. I think we need clarity from the Minister that nothing will impact on or delay the Enniskillen Southern Bypass because it is extremely vital for this town. Thanks, Councillor Blake. Chief Executive, yeah, just thank to, you. to say, Chair, at the time of the agreement of the application at the Special Regeneration and Community Committee, and subsequently we received some uh, community and other expressions of interest, the Council confirmed it wouldn't be supporting any other bids other than its own. Um, and certainly we can follow up on the actions regarding the Enniskill and Southern Relief Bypass. Though maybe just to know, Chair, it is my understanding from what the Department have said previously, there is no money available for this scheme. And the best hope is actually through the uh, Mid-South West Growth Deal, is what we've been advised previously. Okay. But certainly we'll follow up. Thank you, Chief Executive. Are we happy to um, accept that proposal and second our Councillor O'Coffe and Councillor Blake? All agreed? Okay. Thank you, members. Agreed. We'll move on. Uh, item agenda item number six is the regeneration and planning directed report and 6.1 is to consider a report on the meeting of the agriculture liaison group held on the 21st of july maybe in the interest of time kim could we move just to the recommendations on this is that okay members have had this before them the issues and the the recommendations could we have a proposal please councillor green uh, thanks chair uh, uh, i'm happy to propose but i also just want to uh uh, raise an item around this. Um, I, I also want to propose that we write a letter uh, to Minister Poots in relation to the crisis that our local farming industry is in. I know we have an agriculture liaison group meeting soon, but by the time a letter uh, is organised to be sent, it can be too late. So I'm proposing that we uh, send it uh, from tonight's uh, committee meeting in relation to uh, literally all has been done from the Department of Agriculture to help our farming industry is to release the uh, payments early, the single farm payment area, base payment early. And most farmers has it already spent at this stage. And uh, when I say spent, it's uh, spent on paying bills to local um, uh, fertilizer companies to local uh, mail uh, uh, firms to uh, local hardware stores. It's all has a, a, a went a tractor. A farmer goes to fill his tractor. It's over three hundred pound to fill it. It is just not as sustainable, and it just isn't good enough that our department of agriculture is literally doing nothing. They're asleep at the wheel, and. Uh, uh, I I have to say I quite respect Minister Poots as a as a Minister of Agriculture, but on this occasion his silence is definite, and I think we need to write a letter and ask when is there help coming and releasing money early that was already coming uh, is not the answer. We are at the at the at the mercy of international uh, energy firms at the minute. And we'll see where we are with them. If the if the agriculture industry in Ireland and in the north is let fall, which it is on the verge of doing, we will be at the uh, mercy of the international food and agriculture uh, industries from all over the world. And Ireland, with its history, certainly does not need to be in, at the mercy of, of foreign powers. And uh, so I am suggesting that we write a very strong letter to Minister Poots asking when is something going to be done? Because this council has wrote about uh, five, six months ago, and he said there were some plans in progress. I'm still waiting for the plans in progress. Uh, can he uh, update us on when or if they're ever going to, uh, it's ever going to happen? And can he clarify it? Can he do anything while Stormont is down? Is that why he hasn't come up with a, with a, a, some kind of help for the farming industry? 
Okay. So that's my proposal. Okay, Councillor Green and Councillor Felix. Yes, and I'll second um, Seamus' proposal there, and he's just, just not, I'm not going to repeat everything he said, but he's exactly right, including myself, got, getting my single farm payment early, and most farmers have all spent paying off over drafts and everything. We're not in a level playing field at all, but the farmers in the south, a lot of the farmers in the south have got extra money for buying fertiliser last spring, and they're going to get a top up now, and they are still getting their acreage money or ANC money, so we're, we're a severe disadvantage and struggling. So just sec second Seamus' proposal, and like the to get a bit of extra money for us. I know it was good getting the single farm payment early, but it's not good enough. We need extra money if we are, have any chance to survive. Thank you. You happy to second the report as well, Anthony? Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Members, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'd be supportive of the proposal, although uh, I would uh, diverge from Councillor Green's opinion that. Um, he would be respectful of the job that the current minister has done as Dara minister. I would definitely differ and and not go along with that view. I think he's been uh, absolutely shambolic in his role, and uh, I wouldn't echo those sentiments. But I think the the gist of the the proposal put forward by Councillor Green is a very relevant, a very telling, and a and a very needed uh, worthy proposal. Just in relation to the the report from the agricultural group, there's a a proposal that was made by the group that I would have I would be quite concerned with in terms of uh, the broad brush approach that it seems to be taken as the the anti climate change lobby is largely supported by factory or industrial farms and those players. But the proposal made uh, at two point one on page one of the report seems to be one that is helping to incentivize and encourage large-scale industrial farming, which is not traditional, not local to this area, um, at the expense and at the cost of those same small small holding farmers, the local family farms that we would endeavour to support and the ones that have been here for generations. And I think the wording of the proposal and I suppose the, the influence from lobbyists in terms of that, the scare tactics that are constantly being employed to erroneously frighten family farms and family farmers into the or on the impact that that if they uh, that that anything to do with climate change or carbon neutrality or that is something that's going to negatively impact them. I think the the idea that they continue with back best practice, which by and large is what they have been doing, uh, is going to be sufficient. And I think there's without doubt a distinction needs to be drawn between the negative output of uh, uh, local or of uh, the negative output of local family farms, the hugely destructive uh, and unsustainable practices employed by those industrial producers who are causing severe damage to to land, to air, to water, to health and to the environment. Um, the What's noted as well in Appendix 1 in relation to the comments from Mr Finnegan, who is the NAE Air Quality and Biodiversity Team, that there are high levels of ammonia emission in Cavan and Monaghan due to intensive agricultural activities would go to support that. And I would agree with point three there that the further publication of the future agricultural po policy research be undertaken to identify how many active farmers with farms between two and five hectares would be disadvantaged by the, the change in funding provisions, because I think that is uh, when you look at the traditional local small farming, that's something that needs to be done and it's an attempt to combat the department's uh, focus on incentivizing large-scale industrial farmer, which is a farming which is neither suitable or sustainable when attempting to counter the climate change crisis. And That's your time, Councillor. Very, very briefly, Chair, just uh, Appendix 2 it notes the percentage of development ca categories within the extractive industry. Page 12, the EPA study of 992 buildings within a five kilometre site of protected areas in the north involved in intensive agriculture. And page 13 of Appendix 2 as well, the heat map make pretty damning viewing for counties Tyrone and Fermanagh and indeed the neighbouring counties. And I thank you for letting me just conclude that point, Chair. Okay, Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, it's on that latter issue and, and another one. Um, I, you know, the idea of balancing um, the environment against what is called the sustainability of the agricultural industry is a bit of a non sequitur. Uh, 
the, the reality is that the, the agri-food uh, sector is fundamentally non-sustainable as it is currently established. And we see the evidence for that in our rivers, in our lakes, uh, in the soil, in the fact that um, productivity of soil is actually decreasing and so on, and the huge reliance on uh, artificial inputs, which themselves are now being priced out of existence uh, because of the cost of uh, energy. Um, and the idea that somehow <clears throat> that that's something needs to be uh, balanced against the environment, I think is a very dangerous concept. Uh, the small farmer uh, who has for years uh, had a very sustainable approach is not really the problem here. This is about mega farms, uh, big uh, bucks, big, uh, big agri-food, uh, multi-billion pound industries. They treat their workers terrible. They treat the farmers who supply them terrible. Uh, they, they overcharge consumers and they make huge profits. Uh, and it's, uh, this sector is destroying the planet uh, through its greed and through the quest for uh, ever more profits. Uh, and I don't agree with those who think that we need to balance their interests, which is what is represented by the agricultural industry as it's known today, and the interests of uh, the environment, uh, which everyone needs a clean environment. So to me, ammonia, uh, we need to get on top of that. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of answers to be found in traditional farming methods, frankly. The, the other point I wanted to raise is just on the page four, which was under the, um, the proposal now, it seems to be to exclude farmers uh, with uh, farms that's less than five hectares. Uh, and what we're seeing is a move towards the concentration of farms, the attempt to destroy small scale, uh, micro scale farmers who often, as I've just said, are actually among the more environmentally friendly ones. Often they can have, um, you know, permaculture approaches. They're going to be excluded from any funding. The funding is going to be channeled to the larger farmers. Uh, and this is the capitalism in action in the agricultural sector. And fairly soon you will see you're a small time uh, farmer if you don't have, you know, uh, 10,000 acres and uh, thousands of cattle. That's, that's the way things is going. That's the way it is in Latin America already. And now we are going to see the same in our country with uh, the race to the bottom uh, facilitated to free trade deals. So, uh, you know, this is what's being channeled by the neoliberal policies of Storm. And thank you, Chair. Okay, members, we've had a, the report proposed and seconded. We're all uh, great. Chair? Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. Yep, see you now. Yeah. Go ahead. Chair, I've been listening to the debate, and I'm just wondering, is my hearing gone or what? Uh, a, a lot of these people, do they not watch the television and see how many people in the world that are starving? The children and, and uh, the young and the not so young that we see on our TV, uh, and they expect us not to try to do uh, some farming. I don't think they're talking about the farmers in our small province or indeed uh, Ireland as a whole. Uh, if they look at their uh, expensive holidays and the aircrafts and uh, all the tourism, uh, I heard a debate on, on TV uh, only a week ago. And at the, the figures that they are putting out for climate change were actually, as they called it, airbrushed. I would call it fiddled. Uh, and there's nobody pointing the finger at them. But the, the farmer who's working, he can't go and strike. The farmer that's working seven days a week. And in a lot of cases, I, I know ones who have to work because they can't get anybody to do it, 80 hours a week. And they, these are the people that that I'm listening to there tonight who are pointing that been the finger being pointed at that are creating all the problems. This is a, glo a global problem. Climate change is a global uh, problem. It's just not uh, it's, it's pointed out, and it's not Tyrone or Monaghan or, or the few counties that we have around here that's going to uh, really uh, affect the climate change of the world in a global case. So I, I, I'm really, I, and as Councillor Green said there, uh, the, the single farm payment when it came in, that was all spent long, long ago. Uh, in fact, uh, in the springtime when people couldn't get fertilizers, they, they had to go hand and cap, uh, cap in hand to their, to their merchants and, and uh, get uh, they, it on tech, as they call it. And that the merchants, I would say, were very glad to see that this money was coming to pay their bills. So I, I don't know. I, I'm totally disgusted 
at the, the hours, the work and everything else that the, the, the industry puts in. And to hear some of the boys there that never, I would love to have them or see them uh, be left to, to produce their own food for a while. They would know, they would know what, uh, what really goes, takes place on a farm. And the, the the problems that the the farming and the the farmers themselves, the, the stress that they're under, and it's not so it's not about wonder that so many of them uh, really uh, end up with accidents on their farm because they haven't time they're running, and that. So thanks, chair, for giving me thank that you. opportunity. But thank you, Councillor Wilson, for that. Thank you. Now, members, Councillor McCaffrey, very quickly, please. Thank you, Chair Gurmogut. I'll be very brief here. No, I just think it's an appalling argument for someone to make that in order to save the environment, you must be either poor or starving. You know, there are ways um, to, go, to go about this. The farmers play uh, such an important part in the local economies here. Uh, not only do they provide food, but their business is what keeps our local shops and local businesses running. Um, so I think it's an appalling argument to make. Um, it shows a complete lack of understanding of the district, which... Um, the two councillors there uh, are supposed to represent Gurmogut. Okay, members, we have had the report proposed and seconded, um, or we all agreed, and there was a, a, a letter as well included in that. Thank you, members. Okay, 6.2 is to consider a report on various tourism development initiatives, paper C. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Chair, and again, this report has been circulated and um, I'm going straight to the recommendations that the Council notes the outcome of the unsuccessful bid to host the World Predator Boat Fishing Championship from 6th to 8th of October. Retrospectively approves co-sponsorship of the Northern Ireland Hotels Federation Hospitality Exchange 2022 event and agrees nominations for the four places um, uh, which have been given and also does not purchase any tickets for the Holiday at Home Staycation Awards. Okay, members, thank you, Kim, for that. Councillor O'Coffey? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just in relation to the retrospective approval for sponsorship of the uh, Northern Ireland Hotels Federation Hospitality Exchange 2022. I want to express my dissent from that. Uh, I, I in no way can endorse uh, these sort of organisations which are responsible for treating their workers so abysmally in the middle of the lockdown. Workers were summarily uh, made redundant over overnight, losing all their hours because they're on zero hour contracts. In many cases, others who were on less than one year of a contract had no redundancy rights and they were let go of as well. And uh, unfortunately, it appears that many employers in the hospitality sector have uh, uh, just their only priority is the bottom line. Uh, and it doesn't extend to protections for workers, doesn't extend to uh, protections for workers going home after late shifts. Uh, and uh, I'd just add in that there's been no activity on the fact that has been exposed that 95% uh, in a recent survey of hospitality workers in Northern Ireland reported sexual harassment at work and nothing's been done about that either. So I wanted to dissent from that. Thank you, Chair. We'll your dissent, Councillor. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Kim McLaughlin for her report. Uh, take on board what Councillor Coffey has said. However, I'm prepared to propose the recommendations as listed, all three. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor McGuire. Good to care, yeah, and happy to second the proposals. And if I could uh, make a nomination at this stage, uh, Councillor Thomas O'Reilly to attend the, the Federation Hospitality Exchange 2022. Thank you, members. Happy with that nomination, members. Thank you. Uh, any other, uh, Councillor Warrington? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to propose uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong to, uh, to that event as well. Thank okay, you. no problem. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Yes, Chair, that, just a, a couple of points to raise on this. I think it is in item 1.2 or 2.1, sorry, the, the World Predator fishing, fishing Championship. It's unfortunate that we were unsuccessful, but I think it's important to be mindful of the potential future angling competitions which would be excellently and competently hosted by this district in relation to uh, the the final point the 2.3 and the the holiday at home staycation awards whilst it was encouraging that the council was nominated um i would agree that the the can the wording around that that only nominees will only go through to become a finalist if they purchase tickets 
um, is a bit skeptical and I would agree with the officer's recommendation not to purchase any tickets. Just jumping back then to the hospitality exchange, I would be opposed in the uh, in a similar vein of mind as Councillor Coffee has expressed there. The idea that we are spending uh, over a thousand pound plus VAT on this, I would question that uh, use of whether that's appropriate use of public money during a cost of greed crisis. And I would actually be dissenting from that as well on the reasons that the Councillor Coffley quite rightly noted. And that's shocking statistic that 95% of workers within the hospitality industry have reported sexual harassment and sexual abuse and nothing has come of that. And I think we as a council have to be very mindful of that. So I'm just registering my dissent here, Chair. Thank okay, you. Okay, Councillor, thank you for that. That'll be recorded as well. Members of a proposer and seconder, all agreed. And Kim, there's two more uh, places, is that correct, if members get in contact maybe with yourself or Councillor Robinson? Oh, myself. Councillor sure. Robinson, okay. And Councillor Thompson. Chair, sure. if it uh, needs a formal proposal, I propose yeah, Councillor Robinson. Okay. Yeah, I think we can tie it into the original proposal if members are happy. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Garrity. Sorry, Chair, if there was one left, and perhaps there's not, but Councillor Paul Blake would have an interest in attending. I'd propose him and our second okay. proposal. Yep, I'll include Councillor Blake. Thank, thank you. you. Good. That's the four, Kim. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, 6.3 members to consider a report on NA Business Startup Programme Interim and Future Sourcing. Paper D. Kim. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to seek approval on the arrangements for extending the Business Startup Programme, um, which the, the, extending the end date to the 31st of March 2024 and also to provide an update on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. So in, in respect of the business startup programme, uh, I suppose in, in summary, we do have a current programme in place which is funded until the end of this year when EU funding ends in respect of the programme. We don't have agreement in terms of successor funding um, and at this point in time, uh, in respect of a replacement programme, although we have been working across councils to develop a replacement programme. Uh, the proposal really here is to seek to extend the current contract uh, for a one year period um, to allow further development of the successor programme and to seek uh, future funding sources for that. And in terms of extending the current contract for a further year, we, we do need a decision. Uh, by the end of this month to allow us to, to proceed and put that in place in time. And that is in conjunction with uh, CPD advice in, in respect of the of the extension. Around the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, it did bring a, a report uh, to committee in May. Uh, members will be aware that this is the UK successor to ESF and ERDF funds, represents £127 million of funding over a three-year period with 105 million of that core funding and 22 million for adult numeracy. Um, a partnership has now, partnership group has now been established, chaired by Sue Gray from the Department of Leveling Up. And uh, this comprises representatives of local government, community voluntary sector, private sector, and the academic community. And that group is working now uh, and engaging in a series of workshops to put in place uh, a Northern Ireland uh, a Northern Ireland plan, investment plan. It's unlikely that that investment plan will be in place until later in, in the autumn. And so it's unlikely to be significant spend in year. In terms of our financial implications, the 80% funding deficit in terms of the business startup programme will affect the delivery of other programmes within the economic development section um, in, in the 23-24 year. The Goford programme was supported by a contribution from Council of just over 79,000 in the current year, but taking account of opportunities to scale back on some elements, the cost to the Council for the interim year is set to increase to between 145 and 150,000 pounds. We currently receive 265,000 pounds annually from the Department for the Economy for Business Support, um, and the, the, the loss of ERDF and and invest in eye funding for the Go For It programme will significantly impact then upon our economic development budget in the 23-24 year. So a number of recommendations 
are that the Council approves a one-year extension to the Go For It programme for the 23-24 period, and that would be subject to approval by all 11 councils to enter into that contract extension. That we note the increased funding allocation required from 79,000 to a maximum of 150,000. We provide a further update then on arrangements for the interim Go For It programme to future meeting alongside the implications then of that budgetary increase on other economic development initiatives in the 23-24 year, and also that members note the update on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Thank you, Kim, for that. Councillor Campbell, your hand up. Yes, Chairman, I just wanted to clear an interest in the current item in respect of GoFrit funding and also the next item in relation to Peace Plus. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Barry McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to declare an interest as a director of OMA Enterprise Company, but I think it would be appropriate for the benefit of all councillors if we could perhaps write to uh, OMA Enterprise Company and Fermanagh Enterprise, maybe to Marcus Isherwood, the chair in OMA, and I think it's Tom Harper in Fermanagh. And the question would be to explain what loans are available to businesses. Um, are they more attractive loans than other uh, money lending providers, banks, you know, credit unions in respect of business? Um, I think that's information we don't have, and I don't think very many people have. It's my understanding that enterprise companies do disperse loans, but the light is hardly ever shown on that area. And uh, I would like to know, uh, and for the benefit of all other councillors, um, what are the what are the particular characteristics of those loans? Because very often people bemoan the fact that although there's mentoring support for startup businesses, that there isn't any financial support. So I'd make a proposal that we write to both companies and uh, seek that information. You know, detail on the loans that are available and uh, how many such loans are dispersed annually. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think it is important that we uh, take uh, the proactive approach that has been uh, exhibited here uh, around the potential for a one-year uh, gap in funding for economic development activities. I think that's very important. Um, and generally, I think uh, what's been proposed makes sense. Uh, two questions, really. One is the under 2.1.9, I note that we are going to retain our statutory uh, job target. Uh, um, uh, well, I think it has, we have to. Um, but I'm wondering if it's possible to have an additional target because the problem in our county is not the absence of work. The problem in our county is low pay. That's the main problem in, uh, sorry, in Fermanagh and Oma, actually, uh, that it's easy to get work, but it's not easy to get work that pays. And it's a point I'll return to later on in the labour market, which I don't think has been dealt with at all in that. But the overriding issue at the moment, as everyone knows, is the cost of living crisis, with uh, inflation rates likely to go between 18 and 24% by the end of the year. Uh, the reality is that people are going to die uh, in this coming winter with the fuel crisis uh, and the inability to pay. That's just that's the reality of the society that we now are in. And it's not good enough, I believe, to simply create more jobs at the low end of the spectrum. Um, much as that is uh, laudable, if that's all we can achieve. But I do think it's important to set a target, if possible, around the quality of jobs as, de as, as determined by income. Uh, and I don't really, I'm not too concerned whether they're self-employed or they're uh, employed jobs or, f or contractual forms are involved, but it must relate to income. And we need to identify uh, that we create so many living wage jobs effectively. The second, uh, and I'd like to propose that actually, the second question really is around um, the wider issue of uh, uh, what's happening in our economy. And I'm not sure it's reflected in what is before us. We're already see, seeing growing numbers of small businesses collapsing. And I think that we can anticipate that that will accelerate in coming months. Uh, the risk is that we will see structural damage to our economy as a result of those. And structural damage to an economy is not stuff that you reverse easily. 
Again, there are figures I'll return to in the labor market uh, partnership study, which are informative and even more concerning. But um, I think we need to have a, a response that at least reflects um, something around um, uh, an attempt to save as many uh, businesses that exist as we can, because um, they once you lose a business, it, it's not re re-established easily. Your time, councillor. So I, I'd like to see if that could be reflected. Thank you, chair. Okay, thank you, uh, members. Can we have a proposer and seconder for the report, please? Councillor Robinson proposed, and Councillor Paul Blake seconded and agreed. Thank you. We had a proposal by Councillor Michael Duff uh, to write to OMA Enterprise and Fermanagh Enterprise. If I second her for that, please. Councillor Armstrong and agreed. And there was a proposal there by Councillor O'Coffey as well. We a second her for that. Councillor McAleer. Happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members. Are we all agreed on that? Okay. Thank you, members. Passed. Have maybe up. Councillor Campbell's your hand from the last time just for your declaration. I think so, members. Okay. Um, six point three or four is it? Six point uh, four members were on to to consider funded program update report paper E. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, members. So this report gives an update on on funded programs um, in terms of the RDP program, just uh, closing out on and completing claims and working towards the uh, evaluation of the program. Aspire is currently in call three and is funded until the end of this current year. And there's information there on um, and on progress to date around tar meeting targets. For Man and Oma Peace updates, so we have been contacted by SEUPB around a potential underspending piece four uh, and asked um, to submit an expression of interest for potentially an additional £100,000 100, for good relations projects. So we have submitted uh, an expression of interest that needed to be submitted by Friday the 9th of September uh, and we'll keep members informed as to whether that is successful uh, and then how we can potentially uh, formulate specific projects uh, in conjunction with our good relations team uh, for spend. Uh, in terms of Peace Plus, uh, confirmation has been received from SEUPB around our allocation uh, for our Peace Plus action plan of 5.6 million euros. And it's anticipated the call will open uh, October or potentially now November time. Uh, we have convened the Peace Plus partnership it's made up of 14 elected members, 13 social partners and five statutory bodies. The next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, the 20th of September and will be held in the town hall. Business to be conducted includes the affirmation of the chair and election of a vice chair. I've outlined the membership in terms of elected members at 236 and also an update on the social partners at 237 and the statutory body membership at 238. But in advance of the next meeting of the partnership, a nomination is sought from amongst the elected membership for the inaugural chair for the current year up until May 2023. Uh, rotation around remaining years then will be dealt with under the new man mandate. Um, so a, a nomination is, is sought in, in that regard. In terms of TRIPSI, um, we have been working to uh, manage the Rural Business Development Grant Scheme and just in terms of a verbal update, 94 applications have received a letter of offer, uh, totaling grant funding of £291,000. So recommended that we note the update uh, on progress in relation to prior priority six of the Rural Development Programme, note the update in relation to delivery of Aspire, note the underspend available from piece four and approve that we pursue additional funding to deliver a good relations program up to 1st of December 2023, nominate a chair for the Peace Plus Partnership and that we note the update in relation to the Tripsy Rural Business Development Grant Scheme. Thank you, Kim. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Kim, for that report. Uh, under the bit of chair, Peace Plus, um, not sure if it's appropriate, but I would like to nominate Matthew Bell. He's one of the youngest councillors in the chamber, and I think some young blood would be suitable as leading forward this project as something new that we're starting off on again. You happy to propose the report as well? And thank, yes, yeah, the report, okay, the report okay, as thank well. Thank you. And Councillor Armstrong? 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to second the nomination of Councillor Bell for Chair of Peace Plus. Uh, and thank you, Kim, for the report. Could, could I also please ask under Tripsy Rural Business Development, Kim, you mentioned 94 applications were successful out of a total of 111, with funding up to £291,000. Um, the residual, how is that to be spent? If you could let, let us know um, what the plans are for that residual amount. Is there a second call or is, is there another process? Thank you. Just to clarify, that that amount of 346,000 really just represented the grant requested. It didn't represent an allocation. So um, the assessment is around eligible applications which have met uh, the criteria and have reached above the threshold of scoring. So that is the total that will be allocated. Thank you. And you're happy to second the report as well, Councillor Anfrock. Thank you. Are we all agreed? Members and Councillor Bell is nominated as chair. Okay. Uh, item 6.5, members, is to consider a report on Mid South West Region's participation in the Cross Deal uh, Digital Transformation Flexible Fund, paper F. Thank you, Chair. So, this um, report is following the most recent update on the Mid South West programme, which came in June 2022. Um, Members will be aware of the Northern Ireland Executives Complementary Fund and um, Mid South West now has the opportunity to benefit from a cross deal bid which was funded uh, at an amount of £6 million from the Complementary Fund uh, alongside the uh, successful bid from Mid South West for the Industrial Investment Challenge Fund. The bid, the Cross Deal Digital Transformation Fund supports digital innovation and aims to address the financial barrier that small businesses face when um, seeking to invest in, in digital transformation and provides a capital grant fund that will support that investment. The fund value then um, amounts to 7.5 million when you add a contribution from DERA and a contribution from Derry City and Straban who were excluded from, the, from this bid because they had already, they were excluded from the complementary fund because they had already secured funding for an inclusive future fund but they wish to participate and have allocated £450,000 for its involvement. Um, councils have been working on the OBC and have been engaging with a range of partners in, in relation to the development of that OBC. And I've set out some detail around the, the option for delivery and management of the Digital Transformation Fund um, and also around the application process, which will cover about nine funding calls over a three-year period. Um, the Digital Transformation Fund will, is designed to follow on from the existing Digital Surge programme, whereby small and medium-sized businesses are currently working, have the opportunity to work to develop a Digital Transformation Plan. So the Digital Transformation Fund will fall in behind that now and provides the opportunity to secure capital funding to take forward uh, the recommendations within their, their transformation plans. The fund would be managed on a cross-council basis by a Newry Morning Down District Council who have experience through the Full Fibre NI consortium of delivering on, on cross-council projects. In terms of fund outcomes, um, estimated that approximately 600 businesses will be supported across Northern Ireland over a three-year delivery time frame and um, that there is a, an expected return of investment of £2.24 for every pound invested. There are a number of performance indicators as outlined. In terms of the split per council, um, the Fermanagh and Oma area has 8% of the business base. So that would equate to, of the 600 businesses uh, overall, to 48 businesses to benefit in the Fermanagh and Oma district area. And in terms of revenue costs, which need to be met by the councils uh, on top of the capital funding from the complementary fund, that would equate to £69,605 to be met by Fermanagh and Oma Council as its 8% contribution. Um, so there are some time pressures referred to in respect of this report. Councils are asked to commit revenue funding whilst the final stages of the business case approval uh, are progressing uh, alongside this. And the approval process requires Invest and I approval initially prior to progressing through departmental approval mechanisms. Um, there is a November time frame when, when revenue costs are expected to be incurred in respect of this programme. In terms of financial contributions, uh, financial implications, 
Appendix 1 details the revenue cost contribution for each council. As I've said, the, the contribution for Man and Oma District Council is £69,605. Um, and because the programme commences in November of this year, it would actually be allocated across, a f across four financial years with £8,768 to be allocated in the current financial year. Members uh, will be aware that this has not been uh, included in current year's estimates or budgets. Uh, it's a, it's a new, newly emerging programme. But in terms of considering the financial implications, members will also be aware of reports which are being presented uh, tomorrow night to Policy and Resources and of our current situation in terms of uh, future budgetary challenges arranging, arising from cost of living uh, and other pressures uh, and also the uh, current considerations around um, around trade union bids at local uh, at national and local levels and members will want to take that into consideration in regard to uh, their decision on this matter the report was initially presented to the mid southwest governance steering group prior to the summer recess and it was agreed by the mid southwest governance steering group that it should be presented to the three councils it was also agreed that the three councils would go to go forward on a uh, on a on the basis of one or none, all or none uh, participating in this uh, project. Fermanagh and Oma District Council is the first to consider at a council level from amongst the three councils. Uh, I've, Mid Ulster will consider it next week, um, and I'm not just sure yet of when um, ABC will consider. So the recommendations are that the Council notes the intention that the Digital Transformation Fund will operate on a regional basis and will be led by Newry Moran and Down District Council, uh, notes the revenue costs associated with operation of the Digital Transformation Fund based on the pre-development work from November 2022, and considers and endorses the Mid-Southwest Regional, Regional Governance Steering Group's recommendation for the Council to participate in the Digital Transformation Flexible Fund on the basis that all three councils participate or none, and subject that that council approves the council's share of the revenue costs in the amount of £69,605 as part of mid South West's participation in the fund. Thank you, Kim. Members, oh, uh, we need a direction on this. Um, is there anyone willing to propose a direction, please? Uh, Councillor O'Coffey. Sorry, Chair, I'd just like to ask a question in the 2.4. <clears throat> There's a reference there to uh, benefits uh, to businesses will be, this is under the performance indicators, uh, will be focused upon increased employment levels and or turnover levels. I'm just wondering, is that is that upon uh, increased employment and or turnover, or is there something else that's been uh, suggested there? Thank you, Chair. I think the, the the work needs to continue in terms of what the individual targets will be in respect of the program. But the, this is the direction in terms of potential indicators which will be attached around uh, employment levels, um, and a decision needs to be made on whether it's both employment levels and or turnover levels. Very quickly, Councillor Coffee, please. Just yeah, I, I still am not. Is does it mean the number of people employed, or does it mean the efficiency, productivity, um, intensity of labour? Is that, is that what's been referred to there? I'm just trying to work out. It's likely to be an increase in numbers employed. Okay. Have we a proposer, members? We are the first council to consider this out of the three, but. Anybody willing? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, obviously, um, I would normally look to Councillor Irvine for this type of thing, but uh, where, where's the, where are we going to, I mean, 8,700 odd in the first year, I'm assuming, and that's provided the other partners agree as well. So if we, I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it is a lot of money when it's not our money to spend at, at the stage. At stage, so uh, where does the where does the money 
where we creaming it off and and uh and if we do spend it then is is this really a benefit to us and again it's dependent on the other council so we are basically passing if we propose this tonight it's dependent it's still dependent on the other councils or, still or dependent on the three you agreeing together or no well if we decide that we wish to proceed then that will be subject to the other two mid south west councils also agreeing yeah. to proceed but if we decide that we do not wish to proceed, then that means that none of the three Mid South West Councils will take part. So, in terms so, of the budget, um, yes, it's eight thousand seven hundred sixty-eight in the current financial year. There is no provision in existing budget, so we will need to try to find that um, alongside the significant budgetary review, which um, we we know we need to undertake, and the commitment in twenty-three twenty-four. Is for 24,665, 24, 25, 27,065, and 25, 26, 9,107. And the benefits will be that 48 businesses in our district would be able to access um, capital funding for digital transformation. Um, I think I, I do have serious reservations, but I think I'm, I'm going to propose. We go with it, but the issue is then we're still going to have to gather up, even if we get the money this year, and we always seem to have this hat that we can produce money out of out of every year. We can we seem to be able to cover that, but then then we're going to put another load on on of almost sixty thousand, which again with with our overall budget, but it's still another sixty thousand on the repair. So I'm I'm not sure. Well, I think we do need to progress this. I'm, I'm concerned about what the how the benefits, how much of a benefit our businesses are, are going to take out of it, given the provisions that we have for broadband and whatever else. But I'm I'm going to propose we do go with it at this stage. Thank you, Councillor. We a seconder for that. Uh, Councillor Riley. Uh, Chairman, I'm in two minds here because um, I'm just unclear uh, really of the detail in which uh, we can uh, impact businesses with here. We do uh, run our own programs to help businesses and so forth here. So are we on a can i ask him if we are on a, a very tight timeline as to be, to go back to them or is there an opportunity to give us all the detail of exactly what uh, and how many businesses and so forth i suppose it depends on applications coming in and all the rest of it and who's in a position to try to uptake this but there seems a substantial part of money here uh, I'd just be interested to understand the division of that part. Is it dependent on between the three council areas what amount of applications you get per council area? Are we being shared out equally? or the, the breakdown in terms of allocations is based on the existing uh, business base, um, with the exception of agriculture and fishing uh, businesses, which um, and they have had to be excluded because of state aid considerations but taking account of the business base excluding that those those businesses we currently have eight percent of the northern ireland business base eight eight percent is our uh is is our share of the business base so that has been used as the figure to to identify our share of the program uh costs and the program benefits as well so eight percent of the total 600 businesses which will um, benefit across the three years, means that 48 of those businesses will be in for Mana and Doma. Chair, through you, to what total sort of... Uh, Out of 600. So a total of 600 businesses. No, but to what total uh, spend? So each business will be able to apply for funding, yeah, capital that. funding of um, between... capital support of between 5,000 and 20,000, and that would be... Uh, a subvention at 70% maximum. So the businesses themselves will still have to support, will still have to provide 30% of the cost towards the capital 
um, the, the, the capital investment in digital infrastructure. A bit like John, Chair, I'm, um, you know, conscious of where we are with, with funding, but I'm also conscious that uh, business is like everything else. And I'm, I'm extremely disappointed to see that uh, both agricultural and fishery businesses are being excluded again from, from funding through state aid rules. And, uh, but uh, having said that, I think we, we, we do need to support our businesses and give them every equal opportunity to be able to uh, be competitive and to uh, do that digitally. Uh, I think if there's an opportunity to help some of them, uh, I'm prepared to uh, second the uh, John's proposal. Thank you, Councillor O'Reilly. Councillor Armstrong. Yes, Chair. You know, I've listened to the other councillors. I do share the concerns, but bearing in mind the 10x economy, um, I think we have a weakness in digital technology, and I, that's where I think that if we don't um, if we don't take advantage of this, if we don't encourage our businesses to move into more digital technology, we will fall further behind. So I certainly would add um, my support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, members. We all agreed. Okay, we'll move on to item 6.6. .6. Uh, there is three reports left here on this section, members, so just bear in mind our time, please. 6.6 .6 is to consider update report on the Labour Market Partnership, Paper G. Okay, so the purpose of this report is to update members on the Labour Market Partnership and seek approval to proceed to procurement of programmes and activities as set out in the Action Plan for 22-23. And members will be aware that the action plan has already been agreed by Council in April 2022 and has subsequently been approved by the Department for Communities. Um, we did have, the, the, the plan was defined on the basis of potential income. Uh, we did receive a letter of offer, um, which is short of the original indicative um, funding request, although DFC has advised that it's optimistic that that additional funding will become available. Uh, the shortfall is currently 105,000. In the meantime, the Labour Market Partnership identified the areas which it could proceed with, and these have been agreed by the partnership and approved by the Department for Community. And we are currently drafting uh, procurement documentation to take forward those programmes. So it's recommended that the Council notes the update on the Fermanagh Noma Labour Market Partnership and approves the request to proceed with procurement for programmes and activities as set out in the action plan for 22-23, subject to budget confirmation. Thank you, Kim. Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, this is a very interesting report uh, when you read it. Um, there are a lot of uh, concerning indicators, which I think uh, it usefully highlights, which are not often highlighted. Um, I have to say, I thought, uh, in particular, the, the skills situation where, uh, you know, um, an educational system, uh, the skills situations are rather better, but the educational attainment situation is getting worse at both extremes. So in, in we have uh, an increasing proportion of people without any educational qualifications and attainments at all which is obviously a major drag on our economy, but also uh, an absolute, uh, you know, expose of the uh, chronic uh, failed educational system um, that is imposed by Stormont, uh, which is not working and is failing those uh, in what they call the educational long tail of underachievement. At the other end, uh, we are losing uh, people skilled at the highest levels from this economy. Uh, and that is uh, forebodes uh, uh, also concerningly. Um, the other issues are that our pay remains and has actually fallen back against the Northern Ireland average. Uh, but I note that that is total pay. That is not pay per hour. And on a pay per hour basis, we're far further behind. Uh, people in our area work longer hours to get this, uh, to try and get a living wage in. Uh, and that is itself a problem. Uh, there's also major uh, issues here, which is identified around gender inequality, the higher inactivity rates of women in our economy. Uh, and I think that is tied to childcare. Um, so overall, I think it, there's a lot more than I've had time to uh, re review, but uh, I think the evidential base that is before us 
uh, is strong where it is there. I think there could have been more done on the pay side of things, but that is as it is. Uh, I think the proposals around childcare, uh, the training for registered childminders and the apprenticeships are ones which I would be very supportive of. I think that that's the sort of measure we need to have uh, to encourage people into the labour market. We do need to provide low-cost, affordable childcare uh, everywhere if we're going to encourage, in particular, women who are uh, uh, caught in a, a number of traps around childcare, around um, benefit trap as well, which is another major concern that isn't dealt with as well in the report, but uh, perhaps the Department of Communities, if they're funding this, uh, could um, perhaps do something around that. Um, but my main concern is that there are all these measures appear not to really deal with the issue of pay. Even the outcomes and the outputs do not reference pay as a target. Uh, I also note, uh, like on page uh, 17, that there seems to be an injunction uh, 10 seconds, Councillor, please. The motivation to give back to the community rather than being driven by financial need. If that's not a, a, you know, a, a, an explanation of people having to take lower pay to do jobs, then, then otherwise would be the case. And I, I'm quite nervous, finally, uh, in terms of the, um, the uh, commentary in some of the tables there around uh, outputs, outcomes, as being like uh, participants who feel better about themselves following mentorship programs. Now, I, I think feeling better about yourself is a, a short, uh, long way away from having a decent income. So I'd like to propose that we look into some of these matters with a view to their inclusion in the future year that's coming towards us. I realize I'm too late to do anything. I've tried to do it previously, but I would like to see these addressed as issues going forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Well, from a slightly different angle, uh, myself and some of the Councillor colleagues were at a disability advisor group meeting yesterday, and we had uh, quite a good meeting. Um, and, and this matter came up on it, and obviously the statistics surrounding disabled people uh, in employment is it, probably, it's fair to say, it's quite shocking in places. Uh, so we actually thought that this actual uh, committee uh, could do with a representative from the disabled community on it as well, whether it's from the DHE, whether it's from some of the other uh, bodies uh, in Omar and Eskillen, um, we think it certainly would benefit from having uh, just somebody from the disabled area to be able to give their uh, expertise, for the want of a better word, uh, in, in what's required. Thank you. Okay. Are you happy to propose the report as well? Uh, and tie it up to you, Councillor McGuire. I go on my and uh, happy to uh, second uh, Victor's proposal. We had a very worthwhile workshop yesterday, but it was felt that maybe a disabled representative on this group may be of some benefit. So, so if it if at all possible, and uh, quite happy to second the report there too. Chair. Thank you, uh, both Councillor McGuire. And agreed, members. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, if I could just uh, note that we do have a representative from Disability NI um, as a member of the partnership, uh, currently on uh, cur who currently sits on the partnership. Councillor McGuire. Uh, uh, thanks for that, Kim. And again, Chair, thanks for coming around. Well, possibly then, could I, I read uh, make a further proposal, maybe on the back of that? Could we propose that the representative from Disabled NI? could be invited to the Disability Advisory Group to inform uh, our own group what potential there is for engagement there and possibly some beneficial outcomes. Yeah, and second, our Councillor Thompson. Second that, uh, yeah. Chair, sure. okay. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, members, we had a proposal there by Councillor O'Coffey as well. Kim, can that be taken on board? Or? Yes, we, we are commissioning uh, a further report in terms of development of the three-year action plan so we can certainly um, look at those uh, I suppose um, the measures have been agreed by by DFC I, I would make a point about the motivation uh, comment and the motivation measure um, a lot of our, our experience uh, and practical experience notes that people who with low self-esteem often find it a challenge to to uh, aim for re-entering the, the 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 employability market and and this is something which which helps to support them in that journey so i do think it is a valid measure 
Councillor Dehan, are you happy to second that? Yes, yes, I will, Chair. And uh, uh, this is a very interesting report um, and I, I support its adoption. Uh, but I think that uh, Councillor O'Coffey makes very valid uh, points. Um, I, I would particularly agree with his comments regarding affordable childcare. And also, um, I am very concerned uh, regarding the employability of women. I think that we are really uh, losing out through not optimising um, the skills and training of women and um, in particular those who have uh, childcare responsibilities. I think that really we need to make a concerted effort to critically evaluate the issue of affordable childcare. Uh, but I think uh, that, you know, that that is a big job of work and uh, perhaps it's something that we consi could consider uh, at a later stage, perhaps in a dedicated workshop. But I want to second Councillor O'Coffey's uh, proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Councillor McAdoff. Thank you, Chair. Just to commend Kim and the entire team on the work that has gone into establishing the local uh, the, the labour market partnership. I was happy to attend the meeting in the town hall recently, which kind of formalised it after some months, perhaps a year, in existence. And uh, uh, childcare, hospitality, engineering. Um, one local employer in the scaffolding sector contacted me and said there's tremendous opportunities in the scaffolding sector and even in design of scaffolding in particular. He said if anybody goes down that road, he said they have a, a whole lot of work ahead of them. So it's about particular solutions for our community. And I think Ra Rashin Montague may be one of the project officers that's helping to develop this. So I'd like to thank all the team for the work that they've done that I observed the other day. Thank you. But I do support Councillor Warrington and Councillor Maguire. Um, I attended that meeting yesterday in the Bonacre and uh, it was really important uh, to pin down that the disabled voice is being heard because it was said that um, there's a higher rate of unemployment and economic inactivity among disabled people and that the quickest route out of poverty for people with disabilities is employment. So that needs to be nailed. I'm not sure if the disability NI rep actually attended the meeting last week. I'm not sure about that. And that's why perhaps I thought there was a gap and... Uh, that it needed to be filled by the FODC uh, inclusion and access and uh, disability advisory group people. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Okay, agreed, members. 6.7, so you consider update report on performance improvement. And do you just want to move to the recommendations on that one, Kim? Yes, Chair, the documents have all been circulated, so it's recommended that the content of the draft annual performance report is agreed for design and publication. Uh, subject to some data updates where information is unverified at present and that's in advance of the statutory deadline of 30th of September and also the quarter one progress report in respect of the performance improvement plan is noted. Thank you. A proposer please, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks to Director Kim McLaughlin for her report. I'll form you propose recommendations. Thank you. Okay, members, and a seconder please. Councillor Armstrong, thank you. Uh, Councillor Michael Duff, was your hand up from... Four. Thanks, Councillor McAleer. No problem, Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Now, just one question in relation to that, um, and it's a note that's been made just in relation to the council response and forwarding to the committee, um, uh, in terms of the the, the NAAO planning uh, in Northern Ireland report. And I'm just wondering if there's been any advance or any movement on that since since we raised it last. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, yes, members uh, will note that uh, we, ha we have considered both those reports. Um, we are working uh, regionally with other partners to agree the response to the PAC and also to take forward a project plan with, with um, initiatives in relation to each of the recommendations. And also we, we are working um, locally as well on our own change and transformation project around the, the planning portal and, and supporting processes. Thank you, Kim. Okay, members. Uh, agreed. And 6.8 is to consider a report of Director of Regeneration and Planning. Uh, there's two recommendations and just for the, maybe for the group leaders, there's allocation of tickets on this one as well. So if we could have a proposal and seconder for Kim's report, 6.8. 
proposed by Councillor Paul Blake and a seconder by Councillor Paul Stevenson. Is there, uh, if, if the nominations could be forwarded maybe to yourself, Kim, for the Fermanagh Business Awards. Um, thank you, members. Uh, moving on, members, to item seven. Is, is, now, these reports in section seven and eight are only for information, so don't want any debate on them, members, please. Um, 7.1 is to note up to note report on the Council's work with the various community groups and network organisations in relation to support and refugees. Is that uh, Kim? Is, and we can just go straight. To, we can just go straight to the recommend to the recommendation. Can I have a proposal to note that, please? Uh, Councillor Armstrong, thank you, and Councillor Stevenson to second. Thank you, members. All agreed. Seven point two is to note report on updated and actions to promote water safety throughout the district. Uh, can we have a proposal for that, please, Councillor O'Coffey? I'd like to propose that, and uh, just mention in passing that uh, this document appears to confirm that there are no officially designated swimming sites in our district, which is a question I'd asked uh, it could be found out. Um, I, I think that that is disgraceful, frankly, so I'm glad to see it, but we need to re revisit this. This is completely unacceptable. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for your uh, proposal. Thank you. And Councillor Howard Thornton? I would second uh, the, the noting and agree with Councillor Coffey's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And 7.3 members is to note report on the potential installation of a feature on or close to the water visible on the entering in a skill from the Sligo Road. A proposer for that, please, members. 7.3. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, thank you. And a seconder, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, members. All agreed. Councillor McAleer on that one, is it? Yes, Chair, just a very quick note. Um, support the, the, the recommendations, but just, I suppose, under 2.2, that we do need to be mindful of our environmental uh, impact assessments and, and the impact that this could have, because there are a number of points noted there um, that mitigation is going to be need to be taken towards uh, when any development or if any development is considered. So just to be mindful of our responsibilities as the local authority. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And item eight members, Regeneration Planning Director reports eight one as to note the report on the proposal of application notices paper M. And just for noting members, a proposal, please. Councillor Dana Armstrong. Thank you. Ha happy to propose. Thank you. And a seconder, please, Councillor Paul Stevenson. Okay, all agreed. Thank you, members. 8.2 is to note the report on business case approvals. And that's paper N. A proposer, please. Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you, Earl. And a seconder, please, members. Chair. Sure. Oh, thank you, Councillor Wilson. To second, okay. That's seven. That's eight point two. Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, just one question on it in relation to page two, uh, two point four. I see that there's a an indicative budget for Nikarn stabilisation phase three. Um, another one hundred and fifty three thousand pounds is going to go to uh, this castle. And just can I confirm what is the total cost we've spent so far on stabilising a castle while the rest of the lands have gone to a private sector owner? Thank you, Chair. John, can yes. we get back to it? Yeah, Chair, it, it has been provided previously yeah. at okay. previous reports. We will certainly forward that on. Up. Thank you for that, John. 8.3 members is to note update report on the Sperns Partnership Project um, and a proposer to note that document, please. Councillor Stevenson, thank you. And a seconder, please, members. Councillor Paul Robinson, thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just again, uh, a quick comment on it. I think the page two, two point three point one notes the the Sparrows area of outstanding natural beauty management plan, and as it notes, the Sparrows is the only AOMB out of the eight AOMBs in the north without a management plan. And just to stress that it's imperative that this is remedied forthwith. And I, I would urge the council officers and heads of service here meeting this Thursday, the 15th of September, to work energetically on delivering uh, an AOMB management plan for the Sparrows as it's something that's long overdue. Just uh, quickly in, in relation to uh, two other projects would have been carried out locally, the, 
the Green Spaces Dark Skies uh, was a, a, a really unique and excellent event out of the Gorton Lakes at the end of June. And I would congratulate the organisers on it. And, and people can watch the, the YouTube link of the, that particular event on the Spare and Sculpture Trail again, which has proven hugely popular, um, not just in this district area, but right across the, the three districts that it's been involved in, like the Guardian, the Storyteller and the Stargazer. Uh, certainly have and will attract a lot of visitors to the, the three areas where they're situated. So just to make that comment, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. We did get a proposal and second for that report, Kim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, members, for that. We'll move on to item nine is correspondence. Have we dealt with 9.1 yet? No. John? Yes, Chair, if we can take 9.1 um 9.3 together okay. is just uh, from the NAEA in relation to site monitoring in Loch Melvin uh, ASSI for Noten. Okay, two two pieces of correspondence for Noten members. Can we have a proposal to note them? Councillor Anthony Feely. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy enough to note the two. I just want to ask one question about them, and I know um, it was mentioned earlier on about the NAEA. It's a, it's a pity that, uh, sorry, it's a pity that they're um, only checking them. Is it every six years, therefore, I know? In um, Lock Melvin, Miss Beside, me, me, myself there, and I, I know there is, there is issues down there with um, house and the fellow beside it. Maybe there could be sewers um, going into it. So I just would rather if they were checking it more often. And I just see there in was it the OPS is supposed to check it as well, in um, and they didn't get out last year to on on from circumstances. Was that because of COVID, or was there any other reason they didn't get out? And I know that's get was scheduled there and start in August. Is there, does anybody know will they soon be done? Have they went out there yet? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Feely. Hey, John? Chair, yeah, I, I think it uh, has been solely due to COVID. Um, I, I know their, their activities were curtailed over, over the COVID period. Okay, and Councillor Thompson? Again, Chair, and I'll second the noting of items 9.1 and 9.3. Thanks for that. And Stephen McCann? Oh, maybe no, just a second. Here. Thanks. I'm going to second that there. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, members, and uh, 9.2. Is it corresponds at 9.2? Yeah, Chair, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's from HM Treasury in response to a number of queries on the removal of VAT on energy bills and also the where we inquired about the introduction of windfall tax on, on energy companies. Uh, you'll note from the from the correspondence um that the, the in relation to the, the VAT that um, the Treasury have said that it isn't likely that it would uh, cause much effect. And then secondly, in, in relation to the energy profits, that there is a new 25% surcharge on extraordinary profits for oil and gas sector in, in the making. It, it, it corresponds also goes on to list a number of uh, interventions which have been uh, introduced on the 26th of May. Thank you, John. Just for noting again, members, proposal, please. Councillor Paul Robinson and a seconder. Of yeah, I'd like happy to, to second the noting of this, but this is um, uh, it's, you know, shocking again. We're, we're, the, the question really is the government will deliver equivalent support to people in Northern Ireland. And uh, I think there's no, uh, that statement there around the £400 for household support to energy bills. There appears to be no clarity around uh, whether that will happen and when it will happen. And, and in the meantime, I'm sure I'm not the only councillor that'll be meeting people on the street as uh, desperate. How are they going to survive the next few weeks? And, and we have a response here, which is bl blithely committing to, uh, uh, to achieve things which we have no guarantees on, we have no stormant. And I, I, I wonder about the, the worth of any sort of response to that nature. Thank you, Chair. Okay, councillor. Um, that's that piece, members. Moving on to 9.4 is to note correspondence to the 28th of July from NIEA regarding uh, Marlbank area of special scientific interest. Just for noting, members. Proposer, please. Councillor Armstrong, thank you. And a seconder. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Thank you, members, for that. 9.5. Dealt with. Okay. We've did 9.5, members. And 9.6 is to note correspondence dated the 10th of August from Ulster Scots Agency uh, regarding Ulster Scots Language Week. Proposer to note Paul Robinson and a seconder, please, Councillor Earl Thompson. Just for noting, members, thank you. Is there any other correspondence, Kim? We, we dealt with the other piece earlier. 
Okay, members, thank you for your cooperation there. Um, members, I think I'm correct. Uh, the first motion has been withdrawn. Is that correct, Alison? Yes, Chair, that's my understanding from okay. the Democratic Union has to be resubmitted yeah. for the Council meeting. I believe we can get matters dealt with this evening, members. Would, would members be content if we um, move to AOB and confidential and then come back to the motion? Is that okay? So moving on to item 11, AOB. Um, Councillor Warrington approached me. Um, Councillor Warrington, that can be kept to confidential. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, uh, please keep these very brief members. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to bring before this Council the, the recent flooding last week in Ebony. Uh, we would need to contact NI Water and DFI concerning the recent flooding uh, in Ebony on the Letterboy Road last week. Uh, I've been in contact with constituents in the village and they told me that the rain was torrential and that the sewage system was unable to cope, resulting in the manual covers lifting and raw sewage running down the main street and into the road gullies, straight to the river. It's very clear that the sewage and stormwater drainage system in Edirne is not fit for purpose and a drastic overhaul is needed. This is not only detrimental to the ecological system, but also to public health. It was only last year that there was a substantial fish kill in the same river. The heavy rain also resulted in some premises being flooded. And this was the second time and only a matter of days for some of them. One was a small business that was only opened a couple of months ago. I would say this will probably not be the only time this will happen as the pattern of heavy rain will become more likely due to climate change. Ladderboy Road was flooded in several places and at one spot the water was around a foot deep. The roadside gullies and water tables were not fit to cope with the volume of water cascading down the fields resulting in the road being flooded. I experienced this for myself as we were travelling from Pesh to Edirne. Even the traffic was at a standstill for a short time. The state of the drainage system on the roads at present this time is deplorable. This is not the only time this stretch of road has seen excess water. It seems that there are not enough gullies in place to cope with the water. Something needs to be done sooner rather than later to remedy these problems. Thank you. So that's a proposal to write to, to write to both them agencies regarding that, yes. that issue. A seconder members for that, Councillor Anthony Feely. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chef. Let me in there. Funny, I got phone calls that evening as well, it's, and it's not even my area, but uh, they used to get me mixed up with my brother, John, that was a councillor there, and um, it was desperate. They sent me photographs of my phone, and it was serious flooding around a few houses there. I did get on to Charlotte Daly, and they got out very quick and helped, so I'd be happy to second the proposal. Second it, thank you. And Councillor McLaughlin? Yeah, Councillor Stevenson would include Manu Cross and Ardes Cross, which also both flooded. It, it was a localised storm, but uh, it was catastrophic for the people in the area. There's also severe load damage and grass verges gone as well. Happy to include that, Councillor. Okay, and Councillor John Coyle. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, I agree totally. Um, the gullies is inadequate uh, and something needs to be done. Uh, I would like to pay um, tribute to council staff uh, being out on the ground on Friday and uh, helping uh, you know constituents that had their homes uh, and businesses flooded uh, so that we can get them the uh, grant uh, for to help them get back into their properties. Thank you. Okay, members, that's agreed. Thank you. Um, Councillor McElduff had a had a, an item. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and I'll be brief. Uh, in this mandate, our council passed a motion which was proposed, I believe, by Anthony Feely and seconded by Anne-Marie Dumley, councillors, supporting the call for parental alienation to be recognised in law as an offence, in the same way that in recent times, you know, legislation has been developed around coercive control and stalking. Well, recently I met with representatives from... La Dolce Vita project in Derry, their advocates, um, including uh, project manager Donna Marie Logue, as well as a number of people directly impacted by this issue. So I wish to propose an informal council meeting with this group to compare notes, to update each other on progress or otherwise being made towards legislation 
and other related matters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And a second, members, Councillor Feely. Happy to second. Happy to second, yeah. Lovely. And all agreed on that. Thank you, members. Um, I don't think there's any other urgent relevant business. So um, if we could have a proposal to move into confidential, Councillor Anthony Feely and a seconder, Councillor Armstrong. We'll just pause for a moment.
Okay, members, um, I'll ask Director John Boyle to sum up in confidential. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Whilst the committee, um, members consider the the confidential minutes of the Regeneration Community Meeting of Wednesday, the 6th of July, there were no matters arising. Members also considered uh, an issue in, in relation to a public right of way uh, and decided on a course of action. Thank, thank you. Chair. And a proposer to uh, Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Thompson on that update. Thank you, members. Now, on our agenda, we'll go back to item 10, members' notice of motion and 10.2. Is cost of living crisis. Uh, I'm not familiar with the chair and a motion members, but uh, we've only got ten minutes left, so that tells you all you need to know. I don't think the proposer has to read out the the motion. So it's Councillor Coyle is the proposer, if I'm right. Yep, Councillor Coyle, go ahead. Thank you, chair. Um, I'm taking the motion as read. Yep. Uh, I uh, fuel poverty, food poverty, wage poverty. I'm bringing this motion in total dismay at the circumstances we find ourselves in. I think I can speak for everyone as we say that we fully support the Ukrainian people against the Russian aggressor. By these actions has caused an energy crisis in Europe, has affected people here in Fermanagh and Oma and across the north who are willing to, or who will be struggling to pay their bills, put food on the table and heat their homes. And the cost of living crisis is only going to get worse in the months ahead. With high inflation, people who have mortgages will have to pay more, putting further pressures on finances. There is a genuine fear in our community about what this winter could bring and a lack of faith in either Westminster or Stormont to, uh, who will step up and do what's necessary to put, uh, put support in place to get people through it. One of the simplest ways is to support schemes is the restoration of the executive. I am not going to lambast the DUP, but I would ask them to form an exe executive with others who have shown a willingness to do so. I accept that the DUP and the unionist community have issues around the protocol, but we want to see the small number of outstanding issues resolved through a good faith negotiations between the EU and the British government. There is no valid excuse for refusing to govern, given the scale of the crisis facing people here. Any executive should be implementing new support schemes or at the very least funding advice sector organisations that will be inundated in the autumn and winter. The institutions are not currently functioning. There are still caretaker ministers in place with significant spending powers and they should be explaining why they are not doing everything they can to help people currently. Caretaker ministers cannot use the DUP's boycott as an excuse for their own failings since the Assembly election. Prior to the Assembly election, every party had committed to doing everything within their powers to support families struggling as a result of cost of living crisis. That hasn't happened. The SDLP has met uh, with organisations and stakeholders to discuss the response to the cost of living crisis and to establish what's needed and what can be done to help people. We have been calling for a cost of living task force to be established from last year, but this has repeatedly fallen on deaf ears, with caretakers ministers refusing to take action or implement the proposed desired widespread support, or the proposal uh, getting widespread, uh, widespread support. The cost of living emergencies need to be treated the same as the seriousness as the COVID-19 pandemic. Lives and livelihoods are at stake here, and we need to see a whole government approach. The Department of Communities and Minister Deirdre Hargley needs to step up in response to the crisis and needs to detail exactly what steps they have taken to protect and support people so far. I welcome the support packages of, for people on benefits, but again, low income or working class people have been forgotten about and uh, the pressure is extreme. The Affordable Warms Home Scheme has been around for several years, but this has been underfunded and reducing. For Mananoma has a huge number of homes that are inefficient, with the inefficient and with prices increasing for fuel and wages staying stagnant, we need to see a programme to better insulate homes and measures to increase energy efficiency to keep people warm and reduce energy bills alongside, uh, alongside any direct intervention. Our local farming industry... ...and the ministers to help 
Primary producers haven't seen huge increases in prices, but milk, meat and eggs have increased in shops, large processors making extra profits. The public needs to uh, regular updates on what executive departments and ministers is doing to support people as what well, was done in the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole increase, transparency and reassurance that the public that steps are being taken to help them. Uh, the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, needs to urgently announce a package of measures to support people uh, in Britain and the North over the coming days. I don't believe the new minister can be trusted to deliver for the ordinary person. We need to support initiatives to reduce energy bills and would support a mechanism to get this money to people in Northern Ireland. A windfall tax on multi-billion pound oil and gas companies, renationalising of the energy companies, would give government more control over uh, pricing and stop the greed. Uh, huge payouts of chief executives. That's your time, companies. John. Just finish up. Uh, needs to be stopped and give people. Uh, I support the four hundred pound energy bills. Uh, the British government has not been enough, and a scandalous so much time was wasted on a, announcing a new minister. The windfall tax on large companies should be backdated to fund further support for businesses and additional support for businesses who face closure because the cost of energy to run their uh, to run them is biting so hard and it will run uh, make unemployment in our area the failure to address these crises in the weeks ahead have serious consequences on, for working John. people and the most vulnerable households so i ask all political leaders to do everything in their power and i ask people to support the motion Thank you, John. Thank you. And sorry to rush you, but members, we've only got five minutes, so Councillor Blake, very, uh, if you're happy just to second it, if you want any other speakers, but Councillor Blake. Um, John, sorry. There you are. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. I will be extremely quick. Yeah, I'm very happy to be supporting this motion that my colleague, Councillor Coyle, has brought forward. I think it's very important that the government steps up and takes responsibility to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Um, the cost of living crisis is affecting everybody and I spoke to one local business person who informed me that they've seen their energy bills increase from 1500 per month in August 21 to 6700 in August 2022. That's a startling increase which has only served to increase the profits made by our energy companies and hence a tax needs to be placed on these profits. This business person also fears that staff could be laid off and businesses to close for extended periods this winter. People in our district earn on average lower wages so will naturally feel their margins get tighter and tighter as we move forward. We need to stand up and protect the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you, Councillor Blake. Uh, now, any, anybody speaking? Just a sentence, members. It's all we have time for. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. My party will not be taking any part in this debate at all, and not in the circumstances which happened with the Queen. So we will decline anything to do with it. That's okay, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be, uh, uh, Fein will be supporting uh, the, the motion. It's just a pity that uh, John decided to go in and uh, with a scattergun attack on, on all ministers. Uh, I, I just want him to note that he, or the SDLP, could have had one of them interim ministers if they had to nominate somebody uh, to replace Nicola Mallon that lost her seat. Uh, and then she would, uh, the, the, whoever took over would have been able to do some of these things that uh, John was saying. Okay, thank you. Councillor. No, it wasn't finished. Um, uh, that John was, maybe that's the sign to, to wrap up, so I'll wrap up. <laughs> Councillor O'Coughlin, the cost of living crisis to another uh, replay of the old uh, green orange politics, which is failing our communities. Thank you, Chair. So I'll be okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Coyle, uh, Councillor Debbie Coyle. Your hand up. Hi, Councilor. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to repeat everything that's already been said um, around the vulnerable um, people that are working and struggling, even when there's two wage packets in um, and around the businesses that's already been said um, there is that I would like to make one point though about people with disabilities especially those who need medical treatment at home such as CPAP oxygen machines 
or that are fed through a tube. And this was highlighted on a documentary, albeit that it, the documentary was in England, but I know because I work in the hospital that a lot of people here are dependent um, on the, this equipment and that, that needs a lot of electricity. Um, and these people in particular are gonna suffer um, even more than the rest of us and have to make difficult choices if it, if it becomes too expensive. Um, I think um, John cleverly added in um, his um, the speech there, the um, the extra bit that wanted to that Donal wanted in. But I think um, the the first thing to help and support families, businesses, and our community groups who are able to go out and support individuals and families on the ground in the communities. At the very least, we do need a working executive to help alleviate the present struggles and issues. And the DUP do need to um, get back into the assembly and let the ministers that John's talking about start um, delivering um, what he's asking for. But we need the assembly up and running to do that. Thank you. OK. Members, we've, 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 we've reached time. It's half past ten. Um, I'm going to put this to a vote. Now, there was an amend amendment sorry, submitted by Councillor Keenan. Um, members had that received at the last meeting. So we have to take a vote on that amendment, Alison. OK, is Councillor Keenan available to propose his amendment? Chair, Councillor Keenan, I believe is. OK, well, we can't have the amendment, members, so we're voting on the motion as is. Is there any dissent on the motion as presented before us, members? The, just it'll be noted that the DUP aren't taking part in it. So, chair, just to clarify, I seconded the amendment. Am I able to speak on it? Just somewhere? No, Councillor no, Keenan's just just the proposal. Has dropped out. Just the proposal. Sorry, Councillor McAleer. So, is there any dissent, members, apart from uh, any other dissent on the motion wording as before us? Councillor O'Coffey, dissenting. Okay. Councillor, oh, Councillor Coyle, back to you very quickly for a sentence, just so the motion is passed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate people uh, wasn't making political shots, and I don't get involved in orange and green politics uh, for Councillor Coffey's uh, information. Uh, it is about the people on the ground that I am worried about, uh, and I okay. want to get as much support, so thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, officers and members, for your assistance tonight in getting the meeting done. Apologies to those members who couldn't get in there, but thank you and good night. Thank you, Chair.